can you hear me vincent yes ma'am i can hear you okay uh, i am after shadul sir yes ma'am yes good morning everyone i am professor vincent shovi gomes and i have the privilege of being your host today on behalf of ashutosh college it is my pleasure and honor to welcome all of you to the international webinar on aquaculture management a journey towards sustainable development which is jointly organized by the department of industrial aquaculture and fisheries under bvoc studies and iqac i would like to call upon dr shojal bhattacharya convener of postgraduate and research subcommittee ashutosh college to give the welcome address sir uh, very good morning to all of you it is indeed a great pleasure and proud privilege to welcome you all on behalf of ashutosh college management and vice principal professor apurbo rai barsa dr manush kobi iqsc coordinator dr kathagoto rai chudri in this two days international webinar on aquaculture management a journey towards sustainable development this is a very important useful and contemporary subject from the standpoint of food security sustainable development and community upliftment especially for the marginalized section of the community aquaculture has become one of the fastest growing food production practices today i sincerely congratulate and appreciate this endeavor of the department of industrial aquaculture and fishery department of bivok studies for organizing this two days international webinar the 21st century is the century of technologies especially biotechnology nanotechnology and information technology in a technology driven society the application of these technologies in the field of aquaculture and aquaculture management would be highly helpful and i'm sure that will open many new avenues for the research and development i welcome the eminent resource persons of this international webinar Dr. Pratap Mukhopadhyay, Dr. T. T. Ajit Kumar, Dr. Vijay Kali Mahapatra, Dr. Biplap Kumar Bandopadhyay, Dr. Gadadhar Das, all from India, and Dr. Shundi Podar from Malaysia. Their expertise in the field of aquaculture management is highly recognized and appreciated, both nationally and internationally. I welcome Dr. Chandramouli Shan Gupta, Chief Advisor and Examination in Charge, PG Course and BVOC Studies. I also welcome Coordinator and Joint Coordinator Dr. Vidisha Moitro Shen and Professor Moinuddin Sheikh, and also the Convener of this program, Professor Bashudha Bashu, and all the members who are associated with this webinar. and last but not the least the participants I, i welcome the participants of this international webinar i sincerely wish the webinar this webinar to be a grand success thank you very much thank you so much sir now i would like to call dr chandramouli shen gupta chief advisor an examination in charge pg and bbox studies to give this special address thank you vincent very good morning to all the participants of this international webinar on aquaculture management being organized jointly by industrial aquafisheries department of the bbox studies and iqsc aquaculture college uh, before i say a few words about the department uh, may i request professor shantanu modok to kindly uh, share the screen of our department colleague Dr. Park Hatul. 
uh, ladies and gentlemen it is very painful for us but it is also our moral responsibility to remember it left us in the fighting a very hard battle when dr dilba khatun assistant professor department of economics at the college dilba is always uh, remembered by us as a very amiable person with an ever smiling face and a gentle soul Nilduba, wherever you are, if at all, we wish you peace and wish you rest from all the suffering that you have in this world. With that, as life goes on and the show must go on, we continue with the webinar and I come back to my personal address. Um, being the chief advisor and uh, attorney in charge, it's uh, my proud privilege and honor to use the department, which is not... Uh, a very common department in all the colleges so to give all the participants it is important that they get to know what the bureau of department or the bureau of studies is doing at the college uh bureau of studies uh, was established in 2014 under university of calcutta and the two main departments under this uh, course are software development industrial applications and along with the main departments we have uh, seven allied departments of electronics mathematics botany biology of the biology communicate english and hindi and uh, under book studies in four the departments we offer three courses one year diploma two years advanced diploma and finally a three years degree course this degree course is actually provided by first calcutta uh, from college so this is also a very big moment or a very big, uh, i would say privilege for us that our degree is actually endorsed by the university our mother university currently the uh, bibok studies course is being uh, very uh, empty and efficiently uh, steered by coordinator dr kishashen moitro and joint coordinator professor nikhil shake and in both the software development and industrial applications department we have seven very young and bright professors who are apart from teaching into research and into publications and along with them we have faculties from our allied departments of the college and a team of about 12 13 very very young professors and enthusiastic professors are handling this course uh, very ably for uh, the three years that we have in the six semesters uh, i am very proud to say that this uh, particular bibo course does not only uh, give uh, education does not only uh, impart training on sd and iif but also we have under our belt 16 more out of which 10 are with 10 software companies and 6 are with 6 agricultural farms uh, who provide internship to the students of both sd and if and uh, also we have uh, 10 more more in process so by the end of this year we will probably have 26 more uh, through which we finally as students or the students have already passed out will be able to uh, get internship hopefully and another moment of pride for us uh, which also i would like to share we have got a uh, sanction for the postgraduate course uh, for both sd and if so that uh, in near future we will be able to uh, upgrade vivok studies to mvok studies unfortunately because of this uh, pandemic situation it was not possible for us to uh, implement the course uh, in this session but the coordinators and all the enthusiastic faculty members are extremely uh, positive about the fact that next we will be able to begin the first postgraduate uh, master's course in both in the also be a moment of pride for us uh, for me addressing uh, this particular webinar is a moment of happiness and moment of pride because it's only last month we had an international webinar on software development and in less than a month's time we are having another international webinar this time being organized by the uh, department of industrial agriculture fisheries so when in a span of less than one month uh, quite a baby uh, course like we book which was uh, established only in 2014 that is about 7 years uh, the participants uh, will be happy to know that we have organized we have been able to organize two international webinars in less than a month's time and i will give the entire credit to the coordinator the joint coordinators and the very very uh, efficient and enthusiastic uh, faculty members of uh, both the departments who work as a team So congratulations to all of you and being a chief advisor and examiner in charge. It makes me so very proud to be associated with Vivok Studies. Though my subject of study and my subject of teaching is completely different, 
but I love being associated with Evoke for all the accomplishments that they have achieved so far. And hopefully in future with Invoke and with more and more MOOCs and with more and more international webinars and publications, uh, we hope studies will go to places. With that, uh, I thank Professor Shadri Bhattacharya for kindly gracing this webinar with his welcome address and wish all of you a wonderful two days of uh, academic exercise ahead. Uh, I take your leave and hand it over to the uh, coordinator uh, to the anchor of the day, Professor Prince Yushovic Combs, to carry on as per the shape. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, ma'am. Uh, now I would like to request Dr. Bidisha Mitra Sen, coordinator of Bihok Studies, Ashutosh College, to introduce the theme of this webinar. Ma'am. Vincent, good morning, everyone. It's my extreme honor and pleasure to give introduction to the theme of this international webinar on aquaculture management, a journey towards sustainable development. Uh, basically, as we all know, according to FAO, that is uh, Food Agricultural Organization of the United Nations, aquaculture is an industrial process of raising aquatic organisms up to final commercial production within uh, properly partitioned aquatic areas, controlling the environmental practices and uh, certainly administering uh, the life history of those uh, organisms positively. And it has to be considered as an independent industry from the fisheries hitherto. That means aquaculture is organized production of certain crops in the aquatic medium and the crop may be of uh, floral or the faunal uh, of origin. Naturally, the organism cultured has to be obtained by nature as aquatic. So the basic uh, aquaculture management objectives uh, includes the production of protein-rich, nutritive, palatable, and easily digestible human food, benefiting the whole society through some plentiful food supplies at low and a very reasonable cost. And secondly, uh, it includes the, includes the providing of new species and strengthening the stocks of existing uh, fish material in natural and man-made uh, water bodies through artificial recruitment. Another important objective is the production of sport fish or the bait fish for commercial and sport fisheries and the production of um, certain ornamental fishes for some aesthetic purpose. And there are certain macroeconomic and microeconomic points are also involved. Macroeconomic uh, includes the land and aquatic resource utilization. And the microeconomic point of view includes the includes uh, the includes to provide uh, the sustenance and uh, earning of livelihood and monetary profits through commercial and industrial aquaculture in a very uh, very small shell or in a mic microeconomic scale. And finally, the production of certain industrial fish. And in all these objectives has to be attained through a very sustainable way. So now uh, I'm not going to any detail because we have some very eminent professors among us who are stalwarts in their own field. And most of them are my teachers also. And from who I have learned whatever I know today. I welcome you all, sir. Thank you so very much. Over to Vincent. Thank you, ma'am. Now I'd like to welcome our three esteemed speakers for today's session. Dr. Vijay Kali Mahapatro, who will speak on fish seed production through induced breeding. Dr. T. T. Ajit Kumar, who will speak on marine ornamental aquaculture, conservation and livelihood approach. Dr. Godadhar Dash, who will speak on recent advances in fish and shrimp health management for sustainable aquaculture. Our gratitude and thanks to all of you, sir, for gracing today's session. So as you can understand, quite an exciting itinerary is ahead, and I'm sure all the sessions will be enriching and informative for all of you. Now, I would like to call upon Professor Rishi Bhattacharjo to introduce our first speaker, Dr. Vijay Kali Mahapatra. Over to Rishi, sir. Thank you, Shobhik, for giving me this privilege to introduce Dr. B.K. Mahapatra, sir. He is the principal scientist of Indian Council of Agricultural Research, presently working as scientist in charge at CIFE Kolkata Center, India. He has received several awards. 
in recognition of outstanding contribution to inland fisheries and allied science. He got fellow from Inland Fisheries Society of India, December 2007. He has published 111 research papers and articles, written and edited many books, seminar proceedings, and many more. So, without a delay, I shall request VK sir to deliver his valuable lecture today and enrich us. Welcome, sir. Because, sir, you have to unmute your uh, device. It's muted. Sir, hello. Sir, I think you are on mute. Kindly unmute yourself, sir. Hello. Sir, kindly unmute yourself. Vikesa, okay, sir, your, your voice is not audible. Sir, kindly unmute. Rishi, I guess me unmute with the Parchina. Can you please help me? I'm an Amarin take a mute for the Parita, unmute with the Parbona, the Lunaka, leave for a 
জয়েন করতে হবে তাহলে উনি হয়ে যাবে খুব সম্ভবত Hide, hide. Sir, hide, but sir, please click that hide button and you will get. Yes, yes. Yes, sir. Yes, you are audible now, sir. Sir, you are audible, sir. Did you yeah. say you are audible? Yes, sir. Whether it is visible, yeah. Sir, you are visible. Can you kindly lower the computer laptop screen, sir? And then you will be visible. And the presentation is visible, sir. Presentation is visible. Presentation also visible, sir. Yes, you are audible and yes, visible. Sir, yes, sir. You just make it full screen. It is absolutely visible, sir. Okay. Yes, sir. Perfect. Yeah, this is okay now. Yeah. Perfect. So, yeah, good morning, everybody, and uh, uh, respected all the organizer and also other uh, our respectable person and my learned uh, student friend. so i like to thanks and also the appropriate regards to everybody so now i am starting my actual presentation that quality fish seed production through indus breeding why i am choosing this topics uh, because that seed it is very much important for any aquaculture program or any farming program so that's why i thought that the quality fish seed production through indus breeding uh, i will present so uh, if we go through then uh, our that uh, father of indus breeding professor dr eral choudhury he only invented this uh, technique in 1955 for the minor calves and later on in 1957 in the 10 july 1957 he just uh, successfully induced to spawn by injection of the pituitary hormone to all the major calves and uh, you know that uh, to remember him and also this 10 july also declared as a national fish farmer day just 3 uh, days back only we just celebrated that thing also so regards to him he is also guru of every uh, many person and he is also guru our guru so i just uh, so my regards now i am starting uh, that uh, which fish is actually uh, first he induced to breed in 1955 this is the fish that's isomus dendricus and pseudo chenis ethrinoid and uh, later on that uh, different calf species also that major calf species katla rohu brigel even our that exotic calf silver calf grass calf and common calf he able to breed and these are actually the selection criteria that uh, or that male and female how we can identify them that thing i'm showing here you see that this is the uh, yeah, the ear piece the rohu piece this is the pectoral fin through the roughness of the pectoral fin usually we can uh, separate the male from the female in uh, in case of female this pectoral fin it is smooth and if we exert the pressure on the belly then uh, also the male to ooze out and uh, from the swelling of the belly also we can separate the male from a female particularly in the breeding season and here you see if we exert the pressure then this uh, male to also it is coming out now it, i think it is visible and also a palpable abdomen and also this uh, ventral particularly this uh, genital opening if we see we can easily separate and this is actually the after collection of the male and female fish we need to actually uh, separately uh, yeah, kept in the hapa this is called actually breeding hapa here uh, in one male and another in it is female we need to keep them and this is actually the uh, indus uh, sing agent how we uh, how much we need to uh, inject them this is the male fish and female fish female they generally require two injection and male it is required one injection and female and uh, obviously the first injection it is less and uh, second injection it is uh, higher side so in this way the dose may be detected and also uh, we can inject the fish so that the fish will breed this is the pituitary gland we know uh, generally and he also invented with this pituitary gland and now it is also we, we are using various kind of synthetic hormone this uh, pituitary gland we can remove and also preserve in the absolute alcohol and same thing we can use after dehydration also then uh, preparing the solution we can inject the fish 
And now that ready-made inducing agents also it is available, different that over tight, over frame, over face, or so many actually now that uh, inducing agent also available in the market, this is the dose. We can inject them. How we can inject them? This is the, at the generally for up to one kg fish, we can use the uh, insulin syringe and where that uh, total uh, actually volume it is one ml and total unit it is 30. So accordingly, we can also inject the fish. And here that uh, also showing that uh, hormone, what it is also needed for inject the fish. This is the injection technique. We can easily uh, identify they are actually that side uh, in between the dorsal fin and the lateral and sense organ. Uh, you see that same actually easily you can also identify where we are injecting. And another uh, also I'm showing here also it is prominent. Here that lateral line and it is the dorsal fin. On more I just wanted to show so that the side will be clear. Uh, here actually that uh, dorsal fin and the lateral and sense organ in between we need to inject the fish. And after injection only we need to uh, introduce in the eco hatchery and uh, uh, eco hatchery uh, you see it is component it is the diptyol or water resource overhead tank spawning pool hatching pool and the collection chamber and this is the water resource where from we can also use the water for uh, during the uh, breeding and this is the overhead tank where we need to load the water and also this is the breeding pool the male and female brood fish after the final injection a transfer spawning pool for the spawning and immediately water circulation is started. And this is a, uh, a breeding pool in operation. And this is the spawning activity. You see that the fish are doing spawning again. You can see the actually the flash of the, actually uh, their yeah, spawn that it is what is in color. Same thing actually. And before spawning and after spawning, how the fish is look like the brooder fish. This is the before spawning and after spawning, it is uh, release the egg. This is the fertilizer after injection only they will when they release that this fertilizer egg is look like this and when the succeed and uh, developmental stage and uh, easily we can separate the fertilizer and unfertilized egg here actually that all transparent one inside that embryo it is there and that is in the growing stage that is the fertilized egg and in the opaque one it is the unfertilized one here the incubation of the fertilized egg in the hatching pool here that incubation uh, where actually that we need to keep the fish at least uh, that is wake up to uh, that uh, yeah, 24 hours so that it can hatchling will come out and hatchling again we need to keep another uh, 48 hours so that uh, total it is at 76 hours then or 72 hours then all the uh, yolk sac will absorb and that is actually all it is the spawn. And spawn is actually uh, production of the hatchery and this can easily you can sell and also easily you can also stock in your nursery pond. This is the collection technique that pond, spawn collection. So if we that uh, remove the water then automatically it will accumulate in the hapa fixed in a chamber that is called the spawn collection chamber and this is the spawn. Now I am coming to the another species that is how we can uh, breed the magur. So that thing also I uh, wanted to show. Here this is the natural habitat of the magur. Now I am coming, uh, uh, this is the desi magur, the clarious magur, and this is the uh, our exotic magur or videsi magur that is clarious garipinus. Usually you can separate the desi magur from the actually exotic one that uh, presence of actually uh, blotches and also uh, like that white is uh, belly in the uh, belly and in case of actually uh, desi magur, clarious magur, it is either yellowish or blackish or uniform color. So if we see their upper column and, and particularly this uh, skull part, if we see that uh, skull, it is uh, the shape is like this here, only one B it is present here, actually two, three B like structure, one in central and uh, two in uh, side. So usually you can separate the actually our indigenous and exotic one. And uh, brood fish also we need to care and for which the specially uh, formulated feed we need to feed them so that uh, it will uh, mature that uh, uh, good and we will get the healthy egg. This is the homemade pellet feed we can also easily prepare. And uh, actually every day to raising the brood stock also we need to give the uh, artificial sour for enhancing maturity and at least uh, that one hour in every afternoon between uh, the 4 to uh, 6 p.m. 
Now I'm coming to the male and female, and generally the male it is uh, yellow is color, if it is a pure breed, and female it is blackish in color. And uh, when we need to, before uh, actually uh, breeding, and particularly if we raise in the pond also, we need to collect the actually brood fish before uh, breeding operation, and particularly in the monsoon period, it is very difficult to uh, collect them. So we need to collect the brood fish, and also we can keep in the, uh, the tank also, uh, in the cemented tank, and uh, especially we need to provide some mud in the bottom or we can also uh, supply actually some uh, pipe like structure so that easily they can hide and also they can stay very smoothly so that they will not infected also. And uh, in that time only we need to supply some specially uh, special feed like that fish meal or chicken liver or the snail meat or arthur meat or uh, that molluscan meat and silk or pp whatever it is available that thing also uh, we need to supply them or you know in a regular interval so that their maturity will be enhanced at magur fish how we can separate the male and female fish this is the uh, actually male genital papillae which is just like a uh, issue that uh, shape and here actually uh, female genital papillae it is a roundish in color a roundish in uh, shape and also uh, little reddish in color, particularly in the mature stage. Here, actually, that pointed uh, in case of male. And more, uh, you can also know. Yeah, if we see here, actually, that uh, female, it is just ovid shape, and here, actually, some uh, pointed like structure, it is the male and female uh, genital papillae. Now, I'm coming how we can identify the stage, whether they are ripe or not. Uh, here, actually, the two female I'm showing. Uh, you see the genital aperture and here also the genital uh, opening. Here opening uh, not actually clear, but here uh, opening it is pronounced and also and uh, little uh, uh, it is uh, yeah, reddish in color. And here in case of male also, the two yeah, actually that genital papillae we just consider here the genital papillae it is white in color and where it is a pink in color. That means it is ripe stage. And this is the ripe broader. And also, what material is required uh, for actually uh, this uh, for injection and particularly breeding time? This is the uh, syringe or allergy medicine, and also gloves it is required, particularly handle the fish and also uh, that uh, some hormone it is required. And also, we require uh, that uh, uh, one enamel uh, dish and also dropper we require, forceps we require, and also the seizure we require. Because uh, we know that. Uh, Though we are giving the injection and they are not doing the natural breeding. We need to start their egg and also we need to remove the testes and also we just mix with them. And this is actually the fish breeding hormone. And uh, there are different questions whether the same hormone, all the hormone we can use for the all the purpose. That means for breeding of all the fish and also uh, it is uh, for the male and female. There is no separation actually. So different kind of hormone what we are using and that thing also uh, I just presented here. And they are actually, if we need to uh, breed the fish with the carpituitary extract, and in that case, uh, we need to inject 35 mg per kg uh, uh, female and also 2 ml per kg uh, body weight of the female. And in case of carpituitary extract, it is 20 mg per kg body weight and synthetic hormone, it is 0 0.5 ml per kg body weight. This is the site where we need to inject them. One, it is the intramuscular and also in between uh, actually the dorsal fin and the lateral line. Here actually the subcutaneous injection, we can uh, inject them. And uh, just below the uh, our the, the genital papillae and side of the uh, anal fin, any side, we can also inject them. And an another is intraperitoneal, you can uh, inject them uh, just uh, base of the pectoral spine. After injection, they are kept in a cement cistern or in a pool or areas and, and also need to provide. And female are kept under the observation to detect the most appropriate time of the stripping. And we know usually female fish attain the uh, free flowing condition of the egg after 14 to 7 hours of the injection. And the free flowing condition of the female is reached when the egg comes out uh, spontaneously as soon as the fish is uh, uh, tilted backward from its uh, vertical position. So this is actually uh, before uh, um, yeah, uh, striped at the egg, the 
castration uh, for the removal of the TST treat is essential and uh, some surgical blade or the scissors we may use uh, to remove the testis and this is the testis easily you can also identify here yeah, these are the two testis low and uh, we need to uh, remove the testis low first and uh, preparation it is required and initially we need to uh, wash the testis uh, by using 0.91 uh, that uh, normal uh, saline solution and uh, after cleaning we need to keep uh, uh, with a, actually some uh, cloth that uh, nylon cloth mosquito generally the mosquito nylon cloth is having used and uh, when we are doing the artificial uh, uh, fertilization we need to strike the egg and the here actually the striping of egg it is going on here and at that time only we need to actually squeeze the testes and we need to also the drop we need to mix with that uh, with a uh, feather or with the brass and after mixing only we need to wash them properly and also the, this is actually the cleaning egg and this egg uh, actually uh, if it is the fertilized one then this will be like this only and this is actually healthy fertilized egg and uh, here almost uh, same person fertilization and uh, incubation of hatching we can actually uh, we can in the different system we can hatch them and here actually eco hatchery are being used for hatching of the egg and also that uh, uh, simple also with the tar method also we can use actually hatch them the egg and also recently i just uh, this uh, uh, innovation also we made uh, here actually uh, we are using some uh, tray and uh, that that tray we are using for hatching of the egg here you see that same thing if we arrange uh, in the aquarium also you can use here you see that tray where actually we need to uh, actually attach that uh, adhesive egg and uh, we need to spread them and same thing uh, two things are it is uh, important one is uh, some uh, water current we just uh, provided so that some flow will be there and also the always some that uh, some outlet already will teach there so that that water will also go out here actually that the view uh, for showing how actually we are attaching the egg very smoothly we spread the egg this is the hatching time that's a 26 to 31 degree centigrade it is the uh, actually uh, optimum temperature and in between actually it requires 20 to 30 day, uh, hour the hatchling of yolk sac, yolk, yolk sac that hatchling it is from uh, they are uh, provided with the yolk sac here actually that immediate uh, after hatching uh, that hatchling and hatchling also look the this only and this is the view of the hatchling under the microscope and uh, three days old the hatchling without yolk sac and this is the flow through system for rearing of the catfish for fry and fingerling that uh, uh, always some flow through it is going on and occasionally some siphon uh, we need to do for cleaning and here actually the in the during automation process we are provided some actually net so that that hatchling will not go out this is actually the standard measurement of the glass aquarium uh, we can use for the hatching as well as larval rearing also that 120 and 60 and 15 centimeter and uh, and generally for larva come fry rearing it is 120 60 60 and 30 centimeter this is the uh, 12 to 15 days and uh, that uh, uh, our fry and fry generally here actually we need to um, uh, that water volume also it is important for rearing of the uh, the spawn to fry and fry to advanced fry and advanced fry to fingerling stage of the mago here actually that uh, 15 uh, number per liter and 10 number of per liter and also 5 number of per liter in case of spawn fry and advanced fry and here actually the cleaning process and also some more picture I'm showing here for cleaning and bottom mopping it is required and also sometimes after that also we need to actually remove the uh, some uh, some dirty water through siphoning method and this is the advanced fry rearing method only that five number I already mentioned five liter we need to keep and this is the life feed uh, based on the uh, rearing of the spawn to fry uh, different actually the 
जू प्लांटॉन और इवन आर्टिमिया डिफरेंट काइंड ऑफ दैट लाइव एक्चुअली प्लांटॉन यू कैन यूज इवन इन्फोसोरियंस आल्सो यू कैन यूज एंड आल्सो यू कैन यूज आवर एग या मतलब बॉयल्ड एग या कैन मिल्क आल्सो यू कैन मिक्स टुगेदर एंड आल्सो दैट आल्सो यू कैन स्टार्ट इट एज ए स्टार्टर फीड ये आर एक्चुअली द डिफरेंट लाइव फीड ये आर नो and also the chopped the team fix also you can use and initially even with the team fix also we can manage and the fast uh, in that case only we need to uh, yeah the uh, prepare the juice and juice also from the like uh, initial feed also we can use as a juice and later on we can also chop them and uh, afterwards we can also after 15 days we can supply in the actually whole team fix and this is actually the feeding care of the larvae and fry and especially and uh, we need to treat uh, with the uh, at the rate of 25 mg per liter that is oxidative cyclin i uh, need to clean the all the supplied feed so that uh, to avoid the infection and water quality management uh, particularly we need to um, monitor them and al also we need to uh, keep the water clean uh, so that uh, particularly we need to the water quality parameter we need to take care so that their ph value do value and tan value it will be that 7.2 to 7.5 ph or do more than 6 and uh, below 10 uh, also tan it is uh, 0.025 this uh, tan and nitrate very much important otherwise that uh, yeah, mortality of the larva it is uh, rampant this is a glass aquarium where we can raise up to fingerling stage and after fingerling we can raise in the you know uh, we can stock in the stock pond and if we want to raise the advanced fry that also we can do in the pond and in that case one number per liter of water we can also stop this is the disease management because in the catfish especially the magur the disease have actually very much rampant i what i mentioned and for which actually that special treatment that preventive approach that vitamin c we need to administer 1 uh, ml per liter of rearing media and absorbing in uh, the, the, the dry a uh, tv fix for consecutive 7 days with the uh, repetition for twice in the 60 days span of rearing first 7 days it is 7 to to 13 days and second 7 days it is 35 to 42 days and also we need to give the uh, saline bath and generally 3% saline bath for 5 minutes to larva and fry after 7 days onwards uh, at the rate once in a week This is management, uh, particularly that uh, curative approach and uh, uh, that oxytetracycline or chloramphenicol at the rate of uh, 50 mg per kg feed, uh, or the, actually the uh, formalin uh, 25 ppm for bacterial disease. It is very much important. And malacate green also are being used uh, at the rate of 1 ppm in rearing media for fungal disease. This is the magut fingerling. Now I am coming to the another. Uh, a uh, species that is singi we don't know, know that uh, they are breeding season is extended april to september and uh, this is a natural habitat for the singi and also the likewise the mangur we need to keep in the uh, in the that the tank uh, with a properly provided that habitat uh, due to their habitat you know uh, requirement only we need to provide some actually mud or the pipe and this is the special feed what i mentioned also when we are keeping them in the tank we need to provide them some feed and also we can uh, provide also the or supply the feed with the uh, our ready uh, ready made feed available in the market at uh, the pellet feed or the floating feed and if we prepared in our own feed in our farm that uh, our moist feed that we need to supply in the basket this is the brooders and here also i just showing the tips how you can uh, separate the male from a female from the external side you can uh, the this is the female and this is the male and also you know uh, here also male and male and now i am uh, that showing the pinpointed character that genital opening how it is look like this in male and female here actually always that opening that uh, genital opening that pore it at the end of the actually the genital papillae but in case of female that opening it is in the midway so in that uh, that is the position only you can separate otherwise even when in the uh, after laying the egg it is very difficult to separate the female from the male because at that time you will not get that solid belly so in that case you may confuse so the, in this way you can easily separate the male from a female 
and generally for the English reading age it is 1.5 to 2 years it is important and weight it is 200 to 250 gram and male it is 120 to 160 gram and uh, for actually uh, breeding care generally 6 to 8 male it is required for for, you know, for breeding of successful breeding for poor female and in this thing or gent already I have mentioned only thing you remember here that uh, dose it is a 0.5 ml per kg and male it is 2.25 per kg and this is the material requirement that uh, uh, yeah, al already I mentioned that series gloves and uh, also that it is required hormone and now what it is essential here actually the we need to actually uh, mix some water there in the male with the you know, and female hormone because their requirement is a uh, very uh, yeah, actually raise uh, 0.25 ml so 0.25 ml it is very less quantity even in the, this syringe only a 10 division and he, here in case of female it is only the 20 division so if it is male it is a uh, uh, 50 gram size and in that case 20 number will be there and female it is 100 gram also it is only uh, even 10 number it is there so it is very difficult so we need to that proper quantity of actually water it is uh, need to mix them uh, here actually that injection site i'm showing where we need to put the injection to the female uh, here or male. Here it is a lateral line and here it is the dorsal fin in, in between. Here you need to put the injection. And here actually below uh, the, I uh, told uh, in case of Magur also, below the actually genital uh, papillae, uh, here in the side of the anal fin, we need to inject the, put the injection. Here actually that injection, it is uh, that uh, how we are giving. And after injection, in case of mass uh, breeding, of the singi, uh, we need to put in the, yeah, the semen system or you know, uh, and uh, provided with a hapa. So, this is a breeding hapa and specially made with some frame. And uh, here, actually, they will lay egg, and after that, the egg will automatically come out. And here, only we need to put some uh, some sour actually. All these are mainly uh, whatever I'm showing you. This is my improvised actually uh, breeding technique on that uh, device, uh, just what I have prepared. Here also that uh, typical breeding case and with this help also easily you can also in the table itself we can also breed the fish. So this also I specially just prepared this model and here how you can inject them. This is the actually whole structure and this structure this is the opening part where we can actually that uh, yeah, that gateway where that uh, fish we can remove or just enter in the chamber. So this, uh, this is actually that uh, chamber where you have uh, doing the breeding operation here, you see that automation that uh, sour we just provided the sprinkler so that uh, yeah, this is another way actually. There I have shown someone and this is also another technique how we can breed in the aquarium too. So uh, fish automatically they will lay egg and you see that after actually that uh, evening uh, generally four to six hour we just. Uh, uh, in the evening, we just provided injection, and next day morning we need to remove the brood cage. And after removing uh, that fish, we can also release, or we can keep in the semen system again. And here the fertilized egg it will accumulate in the bottom. And uh, this is the hatchling of the singe with the yolk sac, and this is the spawn without yolk sac. And we need to provide the uh, that uh, feed just like magur, or we can also what I mentioned that boiled a. Uh, your cake and milk powder also mixed together, we can supply to the uh, feed to the fish. Here, that glass aquarium we can raise up to uh, 60 days, and uh, especially if there is a provision of pond, also singing, we can raise after five to six days, we can release in the pond so that in the specially prepared nursery pond, uh, so that we can raise the baby fish there for fry and fingerling also in the pond itself. And now I'm coming to the another that another case, two yes, best. I'm hurriedly actually I'm presenting because my time limitation is there, so I wanted to show something. This is that koi actually the desi koi and viet koi and thai koi. How we can easily separate them? Actually, desi koi looks like they are the greenish in color and that uh, bent it is uh, the golden color and viet color is like this and thai koi there will be some bend also. And here you see the breeding pair that uh, upper is male and uh, below it is female. And here you see. Uh, that the female always they are genitally opening it is exposed and in case of male it is a uh, hide so uh, by being this only the vent uh, easily you can separate the male from a female so another important character if you see if we exert the pressure on the belly even that uh, milk will come uh, comes out and here you just see just like cigarette 
uh, here here you see one uh, that uh, impression and that is uh, our uh, that uh, milk it is after exact from the pressure that is coming out and uh, here actually you see uh, there uh, they are actually that material what it is required and also that hormone dose uh, especially the uh, 0.2 and 0.4 ml per kg it is required especially for the breeding of the koi so uh, this is um, easy to breed fish also where we need to put injection here actually some injection it is going on the, uh, the technique and here is the breeding setup of the koi uh, only just one tank it is required and also uh, in the uh, cement system also we can do the breeding here of oh, automation for actually some uh, arrangement of water flow it is uh, arranged through the uh, some summer will pump here actually that same water are being used and uh, also that uh, just like to arrange one sprinkler there and also you see that uh, some aeration also it is provided and how you see that even also with the system also what uh, this model i just prepared and there also you can breed the koi if we release the koi itself they are also doing breeding and next morning you will see the actually the floating wave so uh, that is singing it is singing it but in case of koi it is the floating egg you can see easily and this is automatic uh, hatching it will happen after uh, was 14 to 16 hours that hatchling it will come out and this is uh, we need to provide the actually uh, egg yolk and milk powder as a starter feed i already mentioned in case of magur and singi too also same thing we can also use and especially the uh, that uh, egg yolk only not the white spot and mixed it together with the milk and we need to mix a mixture and same thing we can provide the fish also here you see that after it you need to observe also whether fish are eating or not you will see see their belly it is uh, loaded with the uh, white is and uh, loaded with the that uh, egg yolk or the milk and in that case when the maximum number they are eat that time only you need to stop them and here actually that uh, spawn or early uh, fry it is ready for stocking in the nursery pond now i'm coming to the breeding of the papta that ompo papta and these are actually one ompo papta ompo bimaculatus and ompo pabo also three prominent species it is available in our genetic reward system and also that's why you know here actually how to identify the male from a female and here you see that uh, soft and swollen abdomen in case of female and in case of male it is flat abdomen and easily you can separate the male from the female by observing this yeah and you see this is also the genital uh, uh, opening of genital papilla and just like singi only you need to uh, see that opening it is the end of the papilla and here actually in between middle here actually the male and female we need to no actually keep them for natural breeding only one is to one ratio one male and one female and inducing agent of the ovaprim or ovatide gonopro spontro all the that inducing agent you can use and the dose it is 0.7 to 0.8 ml per kg and male it is 0.4 to 0.5 kg and it is doing the natural breeding though the earlier worker they have mentioned some stripping method but except the magur now all the fish uh, uh, what uh, we are doing that is all the natural breeding only here actually we had to inject the uh, fish here you see this is the dorsal fin and the lateral line they are only same thing you see so that is clear here muscular seed production how we are doing there we need to keep the actually brooder here so that uh, automatically they will breed and same thing next day morning uh, we can uh, remove the brood cage we can uh, release the, that uh, brooder one and uh, that egg also in a, you can collect it and also hatch it in the tray in a in the hatching in the tray method it is very much important because uh, so that the baby fish will go down uh, you know uh, and also only the egg cell and all the unfertilized egg will be remain here and after removing this uh, tray you can remove the maximum dart from the uh, you know from the baby fish this is the fingerling the same way you can raise and here actually uh, some uh, gulsa uh, breeding also it is popular now gulsa tangra uh, because uh, nowadays even some intensive aquaculture it is going on and especially in the our bioplot system or the rice even in the corn culture also the gulsa are being cultivated so gulsa i thought it is very important so we have actually that how the gulsa fish you can breed also this is the male and female you can easily separate the 
male and female fish. And here actually uh, for breeding of bull's heart, two male and one female it is required. And inducing agent, generally ovaprim, ovatide or gonopro, what I mentioned, same thing, you can use it here also. And female fish, it is generally required the 0.8 ml per kg. And also male fish, it is required 0.5 ml per kg. And in this natural breeding uh, of bulls, it is occurred. And this is actually the uh, hatching of the pangas. Uh, you, you know that the pangas also nowadays, in the, particularly in the Noihati, now it is a big industry. And um, more than 300 hatchery are there. And where actually that in you know, one one hatchery, that capacity it is millions of seed you can also they can also produce. Here I also that this is one of my actually survey that time only I that survey that eco hatchery type they are doing breeding 280 and four number only that fungus hatchery specialized hatchery. How that breeding operation you can do here actually the brooder spawn here here you see that this is the pond we can. Uh, raise the brood stock and especially the less depth pond it is required because uh, we need to domesticate the fish when we are raising the uh, brood stock because this is a river and fish and it can also jump and also this is a mighty fish and especially the growth it is are being restricted and uh, generally uh, high stocking density we need to stock them 0.5 kg per square meter to restrict the growth of the brood for easy handling. Here actually the Pangasias, uh, I already mentioned, it is a riverine fish and that's why the change of water in the pond drainage and the refilling, it is also required. And for proper domestication, frequent rating is essential before breeding. In the, within three hours, uh, years and uh, breeding weight of the brood fish are restricted to the 1.5 kg to 2 kg. Here, uh, Up and distended belly with swollen and You are not audible again. Thank you, sir. You are not audible. Thank you, sir. You are not audible. Thank you, sir. You are not audible. Sir, we cannot hear you, sir. Sir, 
sir you are not audible it is samadha hello yes sir godada sir yes sir uh, uh, please talk to uh, please talk to mahapatra uh, directly over phone yes, sir 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 we are we are just that, we are just uh, trying not him. audible yes sir we are just communicating with him yeah Sorry, should we move to the second speaker? I cannot even communicate with the uh, Mr. Mahapatra sir. Yeah, he has come back. Sir, screen is not muted. Should he join again? Should he rejoin and check once? If it... He's not using a mic. He's using a mic.
we are having some technical difficulties. We request your patience. Thank you. হ্যালো Hello? Yeah. Now it is audible and visible too? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Perfectly. Okay. Perfect. Yeah. So, yeah. Here I think uh, we have actually that may, how to identify the male and female fish. Now this uh, farm and feed, it is specially prepared farm and feed, you can also apply. And uh, the, this is the dose of the inducing uh, agent that can't produce the extract if we use. It is a stimulatory first dose, it is 1.5 mg uh, per kg body weight and also after 5 to 6 hours of it is a second uh, uh, resolving dose, it is the 6 mg per kg yeah, body weight and male uh, are injected at the during the second dose to the female, it is at the rate of 1 mg uh, carpidatory extract. And if we use the synthetic hormone, that is only the 0.3 to 0.4 ml per kg and to male it is 0.1 to 0.2 ml per kg body weight, it is required. Here actually if we use the pituitary gland, that dose I am just showing and time of ovulation and also that 11 to 12 hours it is required and fertilization percentage, all the details I have provided here. And here actually when we are doing breeding, and that time actually that uh, collection of brooders, it is required one day before the injection so that uh, and uh, during that time only we are not uh, providing the, any feed and uh, so that all the fecal matter will go out and uh, the belly will be very uh, clean so that when we will exert the pressure on the belly that egg will come out and that time there will be no fecal matter uh, mixed with the egg. So this is the technique we are using. 
and uh, here actually the uh, brooder holding tank that the brooders kept in the holding tank and uh, here actually the time of ovulation i have mentioned and here i'm just showing a step by step this is actually the first step we need to collect the brooders and we need to keep in the uh, tank or in the also uh, hapa fixed in the pond first injection we are providing and after uh, as because it is a pituitary gland after 5 to 6 hours the second injection in another side we are providing and this is the single injection to the male and the collection of milk that first day we need to after that 5 to 6 hour when the fish are ready that time only we need to collect the milk first in a enamel bowl and here we are using that steel bowl also and here actually the stepping up egg and mixing with the egg it is going on and adding of second time milk because after fertilization also if it, uh, needed we can also second time we can add some milk also and you know even one adult uh, even a 2 kg uh, male it can also provide a 200 250 ml of milk so there is no actually shortage of uh, milk so uh, that's why that milk also it has provided so that ensuring the same person fertilization here that washing it is going on and especially that egg it is uh, sticky in nature and uh, that's why special uh, yeah, health it is required. Just to over overcome the problem we are uh, digging the egg by using the multani mati. You know that this uh, specially soil it is uh, uh, earlier we have actually procured from the Bakura. Now it is available even in the uh, our uh, shop also in the Nohiati market and many other places also that the soaking of soil it is required and so soil slurry we need to prepare and preparation of soil slurry and degumming and it is going on how we are doing that mixing of the egg with the soil slurry and here the repeated shaking it is required and here actually washing a egg it is uh, it's required and degumming of egg that how that quantity are, are being used the soil slurry if it is a one liter that is a, a multani mati that is finely seen and then water, it is 7 to 8 liter, and age from the female, it is uh, 2 to 2.5 kg. And generally, and uh, from the 8 kg, this much quantity of egg it is coming. And finger placement, the middle layer in the water column of the handi, and uh, repeated shaking, it is required at least for 15 to 20 minutes. So that uh, egg will be released. And after removal of the adhesive gelatinous covering of the fertilized egg, transferred to a Chinese hatchery or final separate cemented uh, yeah, conical hatchery for the incubation and hatching. Uh, this is actually the seed rearing and care of the hatchling. The fertilized egg has within the 24 hours a temperature ranges between 30 to 30 degrees centigrade. The hatchling fed at the lactogen for the first 48 hours. The hatchling becomes carnivorous uh, from about 72 hours and at this stage the hatchling are transferred immediately to the nursery pond. And uh, this uh, Wallaba too also, we can breed them. Their eggs are generally uh, yeah, sticky in nature. That uh, here actually the how to identify the male from a female, that uh, swollen abdomen, smooth pectoral fin, and genital papillary round with the thick muscular around. And that is actually characteristics of the female. And uh, likewise, the flat abdomen and roughness of the first pectoral fin at the lower side, and narrow and pointed genital papillary in case of male. Here actually the in this breeding that how we can breed them the male are administered two split dose of the pituitary extract per 2.5 to 3 mg each per kg body weight and the female receive the 16 mg per kg in two split dose of 4 to 6 and 10 to 12 mg as the first and second dose respectively. A single dose of the synthetic hormone of the ovaprim at 0.5 to 0 yeah, actually in case of female and 0.3 ml per kg of the male it is required and after four to five hours of the second injection female are ready to stri stripping while over premium administered fish take three to four hours and stripping is done at enamel or plastic just like our you know and uh, we need to mix them and gently and uh, we need to uh, yeah, degumming them also so degumming process it is definitely it is there and seed rearing uh, we can also raise in the a cement system or the uh, fiber tank also and another actually that is the our mistress vitetas actually our fresh water that uh, you know 
uh, Tangra, that is Mr. Vegetas, we can also breed them. How we can separate them, male and female? Here, actually, the genital papillae, that projected genital papillae, here, that genital papillae, it is not uh, no uh, external uh, growth of the genital papillae. Here, actually, male, it is required two, yeah, two uh, male and uh, one female. In this way, we need to, the breeding pair, we need to set an inducing agent, the ovaprin and other synthetic hormone you can use. And female generally required 0.7 ml to 0.8 ml per kg. And male, it is required 0.4 to 0.5 ml per kg. And in this natural breeding occurs in the our Sona Tangra or Mistas Vitetas. And another, uh, we know that popular now, though it is a Mona Tangra, or just Mistas Gulio, and also now uh, popularly also it is breeding and also culture is going on. And it is found in the, you know, our Indian region, and it is primarily a brackish water fish that enter and lives in the fresh water pool. Here actually how we can separate the male and female. Here actually the, you see the male, that genital papillae. And uh, that, uh, but actually very, on a zoom uh, photographs also you can see, this is the male uh, structure of the genital papillae. And here you see in case of female, there is no external growth. And body and body normal in case of uh, actually uh, male and genital papillae elongated and milk to be served on the little pressure of the belly. And belly swollen and soft and no out, outward projection of the genital papillae and egg may come out on the little pressure on the belly. And in this reading of the, you know, that monotangra, if we want to do, that is one, 1.5 to 2 years it is required and weight also female 200 to 250. And this is also it is there. And breeding set is generally two uh, male and one female. And also here that uh, dose it is uh, female 0 0.8 mg per kg. Uh, and also that uh, male it is 0 0.5 uh, mg per kg. And in this natural breeding occur. And generally that egg are sticky in nature so that we can provide some of the actually nylon thread so that it can be attached there. So this is I think all about our the seed production. And uh, now Every seed we need to uh, stock in the uh, specially prepared pond uh, before stocking. It may be in the spawn stage or in the fry stage or in the fingerling stage. So actually that pond uh, we need to prepare must. And if it is seasonal pond, if it is there, then the seed uh, you know, will be there. We can go directly. And in case of the perennial pond, we need to remove the predatory fish first, particularly the marls and other predator like water snake. And perennial pond may be dried up or mohua oil cake may be applied to remove the predatory fish. An application of the organic manure is needed. A liming for correction of the fish is also essential. These unwanted fish must be removed uh, before stocking the spawn, fry, or fingerling in a, any culture pond. And this is the that uh, marl group. We need to, in, and definitely we should remove uh, the, all the marl species. And uh, this is a uh, dry of the pond until the bottom get cracks if we want to dewater the pond and uh, help the eradication of unwanted and harmful microorganism, removal of the some toxic gases from the pond bottom, kill the parasite. So uh, if we able to uh, dry up the pond, that is better. And this is actually the, you know, the general copy fish cater means that is fish eater, fish and popularly known as Jol Dora and another is anhydrous anhydrous that metuli or matuli sub and this is also uh, actually they are eating uh, particularly the juvenile they are eating voraciously and we need to at least we need to protect them so that they can enter and also destroy your actually culture fish and also we need to uh, that uh, predatory birds also we need to keep. Uh, protection and uh, that's why this particularly the panko de grey heron or kingfisher indian pond heron uh, all these are actually uh, voraciously they are eating the uh, juvenile fish uh, this is a technique how we can uh, actually uh, restrict the entry of the bird in the pond uh, by uh, arranging some actually that uh, rope and also sometimes the net and uh, always we need to prepare the pond by application of the organic manuring and so that that sufficient quantity of phytoplankton and zooplankton will produce. And mohua oil cake is applied, it is that, uh, that is, uh, we need to apply the raw cow dung after seven days of the mohua oil cake application at the rate of 5,000 kg per hectare. And if mohua is not applied, RCD should be applied 
10,000 kg per hectare and 15 days before the stocking of the seed. This is the raw cow dung, we can apply. And liming is done after seven days of RCD application. And you, you know that liming is done to correct the acidity and it also helps to keep the pond hygienic. And this is actually the dose if the soil pH is like this and also we can apply the different dose. And this is the water pH scale. Uh, we need to keep our actually pond uh, in that condition so that good growth will be there. And there are different pH scale and that if good growth of the pH uh, in between the 7.5 to 8.2. And this is the application technique of the lime, uh, that uh, mixing of lime with the water, we can apply the lime in the pond and uh, so that pond will be the slightly acidic. It's slightly alkaline in nature and uh, in a slightly alkaline nature that uh, fish are growing well. And also yeah, in the pond, we need to provide particularly for raising the, uh, actually our fingerling there, if we provide some aquatic wood in the side and uh, so that uh, that also harbor the young fish and also they also provide some natural food them and moreover in that uh, uh, restricted age only that a different kind of aquatic insect they lay egg and that uh, actually baby of the actually the insect and there are good food for the fish. So this is uh, then we and the specially prepared we can release the seed and we can grow them and the, maybe it is the nursery we know that is the 12 to 15 days culture and in the rearing it is a three months culture for raising the fingerling and fingerling uh, if we stock in the stocking pond then in that case up to eight to one uh, year it is required to grow the table size fish so this is the fish seed uh, discussion i think that a uh, fish seed it is very much important and especially for our aquaculture and this uh, seed are very important this is uh, some actually that i'm showing thank you very much and this is all about my presentation uh, thank you to the organizer, thank you to the participant, and sorry for the disturbance that is. At that time, I just uh, saw my, uh, actually that it is not uh, mute, that is unmute one, but why that is not functioning, I'm just puzzled. Then afterwards, I just, I am listening uh, from your side, but I am uh, unable to communicate that you are not listening, why you are listening me. So I just uh, shut down, then again I have started, and sorry for the intervention, and sorry for the disturbance. Sorry. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. Hello. Ah, hello. Thank you so much, sir. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, sir. So now we'll have some questions. We have a question, sir. Yeah. Uh, so the question is, uh, what can be an alternative for the uh, pituitary hormone extraction? Is there any alternative for the pituitary hormone extraction? Pituitary hormone? Yes, yeah. any any alternative for that, sir? Yeah, now all are synthetic hormone only. Okay. Yeah, already formula it has invented and where also our CIP, they have given on formula that our Gonopro, that is our product only. So That is patented? Part, yeah. Okay, so it's patented. Or anything? So this question only we want, sir. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Sajal sir. Sajal sir, if it is there, because I have seen, but I am unable to talk. And also, uh, Birisa Madam and all those who have actually chosen me for and uh, giving me the opportunity to deliver this uh, presentation or talk on the fish breeding. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Mavatro. Yeah. Thank you, sir. So Thank I'm you. Okay. Yes. yes. So, and again, a warm thank you to you, sir. And I'm sure today we have lots to take back from this lecture. Uh, now, I'd like to request Professor Rishi Bhattacharya to introduce Dr. T.T. Ajit Kumar. Ishida. Thank you once again, Shobhik, for giving me the opportunity to introduce Dr. T.T. Ajit Kumar, sir. He is currently working as principal scientist and scientist in charge of the Peninsular and Marine Fish Generic Resource Center, ICAR, National Bureau of Science Generic Resource. 
He completed his doctorate in marine biology at Annamalai University and his area of research is aquaculture for conservation and livelihood. He has published more than 110 research publications, both national and international journals. In addition, he contributed for 10 books, 30 book chapters, and 30 popular articles. Dr. Titi Ajit Kumar has received honors, which includes Eureka Forbes Young Scientist Award, Best Researcher in Annamalai University, Best Marine Aquarium Award, both from Government of Kerala and Government of Tamil Nadu, and many more. So without a delay, I shall request Ajit sir to deliver his val valuable speech today. Welcome, sir. Uh, Good morning. My screen is visible. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah, yeah. Uh, good morning and good afternoon to all. Uh, most respected Mahabatra sir, uh, the organizers of this uh, event and uh, authorities of the college and uh, participants. I am very happy at a right time. Uh, you have chosen a right field for uh, conducting a, a topic of uh, seminar on aquaculture. So we have enjoyed the lecture given by Magabhatra sir, a leading uh, scientist working on indigenous fishes of this country. Uh, so I will take you people on a different aspect. It is on exclusively on marine. Actually, the my topic is on the ornamental fish as well as ornamental invertebrates. Both are uh, marine. So you know that uh, aquarium technology is uh, booming like anything day by day. And uh, of course, 99 percentage of the freshwater ornamental fishes, we have well-established technologies and all the supply is coming from the hatcheries. But however, 99 percentage of the marine ornamental organisms, it is coming from wild. Of course, we have a very long coastline. However, the ornamental organisms are available only in the coral reef regions. So India is blessed with the Gulf of Manar, Gulf of Kutch, Lakshadweep, and Andaman. So if we are continuously exploiting these resources, definitely at one stage, there will be a stock depletion, and automatically the organism will fall under the uh, red list. So what happened to our sea or sea cucumber? So keeping in this mind, the now government of India has coming forward to uh, pumping money to developing a lot of technology for the hatchery propagation of ornamentals and providing livelihood option to the uh, coastal community of our country. So NBFGR, National Bureau of Fish Genetic Resources, the institute uh, um, uh, working on uh, cataloging the fish genetic resources of the country and uh, uh, providing livelihood to the uh, rural poor. First time we took assignment on working with this marine ornamental. So we have two program, one in coastal Maharashtra and uh, another one in Lakshadweep. I will be briefing both the programs. Friends, the marine ornamental fishes, when compared to freshwater, it is more beautiful. You can get different sizes of fishes. You can get a, a different shape, color, attraction. Okay, name a color. You can get it from ocean. That is the advantages of marine ornamental fish. And we can rightly say it is a living jewels of the ocean. The unit value of this ornamental fish is higher than the food fish. That's what Magabhitra Sarga has presented, this Katla, Rogu, Mirgal and all. The, maybe the cost of the fish, when it comes to the market, one kg of fish is some 200, uh, 300 rupees only. Likewise, in marine, we have cobia, we have lattice calcarifer and we have pambano. The cost of the fish is some 300, 400, 500 only. But here in the case of marine ornamental, you, you can't believe the cost of one single 
uh, angel fish cost around 2000 rupees so that is the advantage for this marine ornamentals if you are looking the trade value of this ornamental it is very huge however india share to ornamental trade is very limited we have a lot of resources i told that we have gulf of Manar, we have lakshadi we have andaman and uh, gulf of kach but however um, we are not utilizing the resources properly and we don't have uh, proper technology for the captive propagation so if we can come forward definitely we can also contribute more to the global trade and we can earn good income through this marine ornamental fish export Friends, actually, we are talking the development of science in any, uh, uh, wherever, uh, uh, any subject, we are telling that science is growing like uh, anything. Here, the ornamental aquaculture also, particularly this marine ornamental also, um, uh, science is growing day by day. So, for example, synthetic salt is there. Earlier, the man who is sitting in in the coastal region, he can rear uh, uh, um, uh, marine fish. Now, see, the uh, in the Delhi airport, they are maintaining the marine aquarium very nicely, thanks to synthetic salt. It can be available almost all the aquarium stuff. You can dissolve in fresh water. It will get the seawater property. Like with sophisticated instruments, denitrifier, ozonizer, a protein skimmer, and all this. So if you can install all these things, but you can rear the fishes uh, anywhere in the country and that is the advantage for the growing trend of this marine ornamental trade. So if you are seeing the business potential of this ornamental trade, the present demand is big. However, our supply is too small and the future demand will be very big. Why I am saying the future demand will be big is recently Honorable Supreme Court has given me a judgment. Actually, um, uh, the apartment systems, pet animals are not allowed. Actually, you know, day by day, our stress is increasing. So, when, uh, all they are beginning to keep some pet animals. So, apartment systems, um, uh, maybe if you are keeping some dog or cow or some bats, it may create some noise. So the neighbor, if, if he is not preparing that thing, um, uh, he will get some uh, disturbance and all. So one gentleman filed a case and uh, Honorable Supreme Court has given a judgment. You are not in apartment systems, not allowed to keep uh, um, uh, pet animals. So the alternate way for our uh, tense relaxation and our hobby and uh, other things, the ornamental aquaculture. So science is saying, if you are continuously watching the fish automatically, your blood pressure will reduce. Then it is a very good exercise for your uh, eyes also. Because if you are seeing the fish continuously, suppose the, uh, the fish is in the tank, it used to go here and there. So automatically your eyeballs will move here and there. It is a very good exercise for uh, eyes. So it is uh, all the way. It is uh, supporting for our income. It is a hobby. It is a decorative material. Besides health concern also, it is uh, helping for our uh, blood pressure reduction, reduction and all other things. Friends, this was the scenario in some 10, 15 years back. A poor uh, uh, fish breeder, he used to breed the fish on his backyard and he used to sell... Uh, um, uh, packing it in small pot packets and sell on bicycle. He move here and there by his bicycle and selling the fish. But now the scenario got a lot of changes because the technology development. This photograph, one of my uh, friend from USA, he has sent actually as a part of biodiversity conservation, creating awareness among the public. This uh, uh, measure has been taken by the US government. Actually, this is the mobile aquaria. It used to um, uh, and uh, move here and there, some 10, 15 kilometers every day, this uh, mobile aquaria will go. So it's a, uh, the way I'm uh, showing this is, this is the technology development. Of course, it is a freshwater. Gradually, we may get a mobile aquaria for marine also. So, friends, uh, ornamentally is concerned, we have two groups of fishes. One is on freshwater and another one is uh, marine. Freshwater is, uh, fresh, among the freshwater, we have two groups. One is on indigenous, our own native resources. Um, and, uh, we have blessed with the uh, Northeast and uh, uh, Western Ghats. So I want to mention one thing. Um, many indigenous fish species, the technology has been developed by uh, Magabhadra Sar and his team and they have extended the technology to the uh, 
local people of West Bengal and they are pro- I, uh, they're getting regular income through that lively good thing. Like we see, uh, this is all of the fishes, our institute, we have documented from the Western Guards. They have very good demand in the local market. A few of them have very good technology for the captive, uh, captive propagation also. Friends, the, um, the, uh, what I have shown earlier is freshwater fishes indigenous. What now I am showing is freshwater ornamental fishes, but it is exotic, not native of India. See the discus, the goldfish, this Oscar and the angel. These all fishes are not native of India. However, it is domestic domesticated in India. It is legally or illegally entered into Indian market and we have bred several population and several po- breeding population has been established in the country and it is providing to the livelihood of the many people of our country. So, see, this caracious aratus, you all people uh, know that um, uh, goldfish, our uh, goldfish. This, this is the original strain of caracious aratus, but the genetically modification and crossbreeding and uh, other scientific uh, components resulted all these variants. If you are supposed to test the um, uh, DNA of this front tail or lion head or black mode, it will reflect the uh, uh, DNA of this caracious RHS. But according to the take as interest, because hobbies, they are preferring new, new, new. So the, what the uh, traders, they are uh, doing is they are doing some genetic work and crossbreeding. They are uh, introducing new variants. So recently, recently some one year back, we have conducted a survey in the, all the aquarium shops of our country and more than 100 variants of this goldfish alone reported from our India. So that is the development of uh, science. So friends, the exotic, now it is a serious problem in our country. Actually, uh, the government of India is legally permitted to import 92 fishes from any other, other countries. So one among the fish is the, uh, this one, uh, this Paku. Paku, it is a herbivorous fish. In the name of Paku, this piranha fish is uh, introduced to India. And now our natural systems, this piranha population is started uh, multiplying. So it is a serious threat to our marine biodiversity. So I am telling this thing is, it will not be happen to marine ecosystem or freshwater ecosystem. If we have our own technology, if we have utilizing our own uh, resources, there is no need to bring out other organisms from a foreign country. So, um, and, uh, it is a th- threat. Uh, due to this piranha, uh, we are losing our own uh, native resources. Then, this sucker mouth cat, you know that uh, whoever maintaining aquarium in freshwater aquarium in their home, they might have known about this fish. It is a scavenger fish. It used to clean the tank. So those who are keeping uh, aquarium in their home, for example, their um, uh, goldfish aquarium, angel aquarium, or guppy aquarium, they used to introduce one or two this uh, sucker mouth cat. This is a fast growing fish. So what it will do, it will grow very fast than the um, uh, other fishes. So at one stage, when it retains the maximum growth, it started agitating the water and spoiling the water quality. So the hobbies to what they are doing is simply they are taking the fish and throwing near the water body. So now the thing is the breeding population of this sucker mouth fish uh, uh, has been reported from River Kaveri because some hobbies from uh, West Bengal, some garbage from Mumbai, like that, they are simply throwing. So now it is entered into the natural water bodies and the natural system, we have reported the breeding population of the uh, sucker mouth cat. Again, it is a serious threat to um, uh, freshwater body. Then, this is the another one important uh, issue nowadays we are facing in the marine uh, marine ecosystem. Actually, I told that this marine ornamental fishes are found only in uh, coral reef region. Actually, there is a um, um, uh, low tide and high tide. So, during low tide, it is visible to see where your fish is available in the reef region. 
so what the fish collector is doing he is simply dissolving the cyanide you know that cyanide is a poison one so he is simply dissolving the cyanide in the minimal quantity and he is spreading the water in the reef region so what will happen all the fishes available in that region will get stunned it loses the conscious so what this collector will do he used to collect the uh, his uh, target fish target fish in the sense which fish get higher rate in the market that is his target fish so he is not at all bothering about the uh, egg and larvae and other fish uh, other non target fishes so automatically it is a heavy loss to our biodiversity of course our forest department is taking lots of efforts to arrest on uh, all these thing illegal fishing practices so, however still some practices is going on so that the bamboo cage this operating bamboo cages is the advisable one but however this operation will be made by a trained uh, scuba diver means uh, uh, there is no issue because this coral reef it is a branch like structure i will show the in the next slide so when we are operating the cages if a non trained guy if he will operate the coral will get broken and what will happen um, and, uh, it is a threat to our biodiversity so this things also we have to avoid then bycatch resources actually um, and, uh, this photograph i have took uh, taken from gulf of manar biosphere reserve in tamil nadu see the if this angel fish is on live the cost of this fish is 2000 rupees more than 2000 rupees but however it comes to the market as a food fish along with the food fish the cost is less than 10 15 rupees so that is the fact so we have to avoid the fishing practices in the reef region as well as we should maximum avoid this collecting this ornamental fish uh, ornamental fishes then now the serious problem is the climate change we are talking about climate change we are telling that uh, it is um, uh, climate change is spoiling our biodiversity city see friends this is the witness that we documented in lakshadweep this photograph this gatrakis magnifica this tentacle anemone and this clown fish clown and tentacle anemone have good uh, symbiotic relationship this photograph we have took, uh, taken from lakshadweep during february 2020 so the same year during uh, uh, i may may and june the same region we took this photograph from, uh, see the color of the sea anemone when we were taking the this photograph the sea surface temperature was 20 temperature was 31 so 2 3 degree centigrade um, temperature elevation got coral reef um, bleaching as well as this animals lose its so sandal so this coral as well as this fried acna it is losing the colors so automatically what will happen the breeding spawning as well as fecundity everything will be uh, disturbed so all these thing we have to uh, study in the near future and we have to um, uh, find solution for all this thing of course it is a natural phenomena however we have to uh, find solution for this then friends coral propagation is now being practices uh, practiced now this lakshadweep uh, uh, department of science and technology and the national institute of oceanography they have done some coral propagation and shortly uh, once it started growing this ornamental fishes also um, uh, assembling on that uh, new, uh, newly uh, formed corals but however it is a cost effective and time consuming one we have technology but uh, the uh, it is a time consuming as well as the uh, cost effective one so i told about the exotic in marine freshwater ornamental fishes likewise in marine also see how beautiful this fishes this is um, uh, illegally introduced in our indian marine aquarium trade actually i told that 92 species legally we we are import think however this four fishes not fall under their list however the, but these fishes plenty available in our aquarium market at kolkata chennai um, uh, bangalore and hyderabad okay so we have to stop all this thing the, my intention is we have to develop our own native resources we have to develop uh, technologies and we have to disseminate the technology so our resources will be served as well as um, the poor fishermen they will get some uh, uh, livelihood opportunities through ornamental fish sale whatever is 
rising from the captivity. So see, this is the photograph we to, uh, took from Lakshadweep. See, this is the uh, branches of this coral reef, coral live coral reef. It is very difficult to catch this fish by hand or net. So if you try to catch this fish, immediately it will go and, and settle near the coral reef. So it is uh, difficult to catch. So that's why what these people are doing. Simply they are spreading some cyanide and other material. So the fish will get stunned. So immediately he will collect and put it into uh, quality water and provide good aeration. So automatically it will come to normal and they are simply sending to the uh, aquarium trade. So that should be avoided. That should be avoided. Okay. So now I will come to the point that uh, what is the prospects of marine ornamental aquaculture? So it is avoid, um, uh, helping for uh, habit destruct, uh, destruction, then helping for environmental uh, degradation, avoiding over exploitation and avoiding selective harvesting. Friends, actually what I mean selective harvesting is among the ornamental organism, all the male fellows are beautiful than the female. So the poor fisherman who is collecting the fish, he doesn't know which one is male, which one is female. But he used to collect which one is more attractive. So what will happen? Automatically at one point, all this the male will be collecting from one particular ecosystem. It means there is a lack of male in the male population in the particular ecosystem system so reproductive strategy will be getting failed so this is the this we have to come across so the alternative way is breeding um, breeding of this fishes in captive condition then economically feasible when compared to marine food or uh, fish culture so beginning i told we have india we have technology for this cobia pabano and the sea bass uh, it is taking more than a year to reach marketable size but however this clownfish and the ornamental shrimps so what we are maintaining is taking only three to four months to reach the marketable size. So that is the advantage for this marine ornamental organisms. So these all are the top 10 fishes playing major role in the marine aquarium trade. The freshwater is concerned we are telling that guppy, moly, gold, angel, all are the um, uh, top 10 organisms. Likewise, this uh, uh, damsel, uh, cardinal, uh, this parrotfish, uh, surgeon, lionfish, uh, ross, butterfly, again angel, uh, triggerfish, clown, and the angel. So these all fishes uh, or ten fishes are playing major role in the aquarium trade. So is it possible to breed all the fishes in captivity? It is somewhat difficulty because um, uh, based on the reproductive pattern of this marine ornamental organism, we we can categorize them into four groups. Actually, one is egg depositor. Here, the parental care is more. So, we have the well-developed, India have well-developed the technology for clown and the damsel. See, the egg deposition of the clown. So, everything will be happened. The egg deposition, hatch out, all things will be happened before your eyes. So, um, moreover, the parental care is more in this egg depositor group. So, India, we have the well-developed technology for the egg depositor group. Second one is the egg scattering group, the angel and the butterfly group. Actually, here, the female used to lay the egg. Sometimes the male will get, uh, fertilize it and the, the egg will be scattered. It is very difficult to find out the egg on your open water. So, uh, here, captive cap breeding is somewhat uh, difficult. In recent days, in Taiwan, one, they have bred some uh, angels and they have got some experimental success. Then third one is mouth brooders. This example is cardinal fish. Here, the female used to release the egg and the male fellow will fertilize and immediately it uh, used to keep the egg on his mouth. In the freshwater food fish is concerned, the catfish is the best example. Likewise, this cardinal fish used to keep the egg on its mouth. The uh, male fellow never take any feed, uh, feed during this incubation period. It is uh, six to eight days. It is to keep the egg on its mouth and it releases the egg on. So that is the mouth brooder. Of course, we, India, we have the successful technology. Then the, fact, the fourth one is the live bearers. Live bearers actually, again, the female used to lay the egg on the pouch of the male. Pouch of the male. Pouch of the male. And the male fellow only used to give the birth of the young ones. So among the living 
living organisms the seagars is the the male seagars is facing the labor pain labor pain okay so he, and this of course seagars also in the we have well developed the technology but however this animal is under scheduled it is in the red list so it is not allowed to keep on home aquaria or public aquaria the research institute if they are getting permission from ministry of environment and forest government of india they may allow to breed this organism and allowed only for sea ranging whatever we are breeding we should re 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 introduce to the um, natural system like we have the uh, uh, we have some program uh, operated by anamal university and cmfra so friends um, based on the reproductive start, uh, patterns we have four groups and except this egg scattering group india we have well developed technology so now i'll be talking about the clownfish I mean, uh, actually clown it is the best example for symbiotic relationship this mutual relationship is um, known between this clown and uh, um, sea anemone if you are feeding the clownfish um, if you will feed the clownfish it will um, uh, take the feed and started eating on the top of the sea anemone so whatever the uneaten particles uh, uh, falling down on the sea anemone it serves as a feed to the sea anemone because sea anemone is a sedentary animal it don't move here and there okay so sea anemone is a sedentary animal it gets feed through the clownfish if you try to catch this clownfish it immediately goes to the mouth of the sea anemone so sea uh, clownfish get protection from its predators here the important thing is the if any fish other than clownfish goes to the mouth of the sea anemone immediately this sea anemone will kill the fish so the sea since they have the symbiotic relationship this sea anemone won't disturb the clownfish actually the reason behind this there is a mucus secreting on the body of the clownfish that mucus mimicate the mucus secreting in the sea anemone so that is the uh, secret behind that a uh, lot of uh, theories are there that i am not uh, explaining briefly then this fish have a peculiar character that is protandrous hermaphrodite that is by birth all clownfishes are subadult male then the surrounding environment is deciding who is the male and who is the female so always the dominant fish in a group become female okay so the advantage of this is when the poor fish farmer a lemon if he is breeding no need to bring potential male potential female through his sides no need if he can accommodate any two in a ca captivity automatically you will get within 3 4 months as a pair always the dominant one become female dominant in the sense if you are feeding which one is come and take the feed first that is the dominant fish okay friends actually this is um, ambipreya nocellaris this is ambipreya sibe this is ambipreya percula actually almost these two fishes looking same however this black marking is not uh, found in ambipreya nocellaris then it is the premenus biculata see this is the egg deposit deposition actually there was a movie uh, finding nemo uh, from some two Two three years back, uh, there was a cartoon movie. After that, this fish got more familiar. Find, uh, after that, Finding Nemo mi uh, movie, so this uh, fish got familiar, and the cost of this fish, the single one, cost around three hundred, four hundred rupees. What I'm telling is a juvenile one, some two centimeter, less than two centimeter. However, if it uh, reaches some four five centimeters, the cost is more than eight hundred, nine hundred rupees. So this is the young ones we bred in our hatchery at uh, uh, Ayroli Magarasa. I'll be briefing uh, what NBFGR is doing. so friends yeah, um, initially i told about the um, uh, this thing uh, variants in goldfish variants in goldfish likewise now this uh, people are introducing some uh, picasso clown and designer clown in uh, um, marine aquarium trade also all these fishes available in uh, aquarium trade so keeping this in uh, mind we have done an experiment actually between species we bre uh, we try to breed see this is the ambipreya percula male and this is the ambipreya ocellaris female see this black marking is missing in uh, female ocellaris so we try to put both the fishes in one tank but more than 2 years each of them got fight and the one got died so after 2 and a half years we got a successful pair and we got the egg 
egg deposition and we produced the young ones and we um, uh, published the outcome of that uh, uh, finding in aquaculture research journal see we made a triad analysis we made a triad analysis and we found that the f1 generation is so color wise it is superior than the parent as well as it have some disease resistant capacity so that is the advantage of this cross breeding here there is no hormone we have used there is no genetic uh, work we have done just natural spawning we achieved between two species that's all so friend this is about the damsel fishes what you are seeing is humpback damsel here what you are seeing is green chromis both we got some experimental success and now we are planning to upscaling the technology of this chromis viridis in lakshadweep for the supply of aquarium trade as well as the, this fish is using as a live bait in the uh, lakshadweep for catching the tuna so now the population is getting declined so we will be planning to introduce um, and, uh, breeding this and uh, upscaling the technology and supplying to the tuna farmer uh, tuna uh, fishes okay so this is again the cardinal fish bangai cardinal of course it is a exotic fish uh, not found in indian water best example for mouth brooder see this experiment we have done in our laboratory when i was working in anamala university so later part we found that it is exotic and not in the imported list so we discarded the things to the supplier so this is another one in importing fish pseudochromis and uh, we can call it as a dotty box dotty box so this technology also so we have standardized and um, an, um, successful production is being practiced friends this is about sea horse i told it is not allowed to keep uh, keep in aquarium or public aquaria um, aquaria but there is lot of potential medicinal values there so very good demand is there still illegal fishing practices going on so we have to legally get permission from the government of india ministry of environment and produce them in large quantity and uh, continuous sea ranging program we have to do throughout our coastal region particularly in the reef regions of india so this is the program i told that our institute the national bureau of fish genetic resources is currently uh, doing in maharashtra actually in maharashtra there is a mangrove foundation um, uh, it is the um, attached unit of government of uh, uh, maharashtra forest department so they given us a project and we established a big hatchery in airoli thane it is navi mumbai and there we have stocked more than 10 different species of fishes see this all are the um, view of the hatchery 10 different fishes we have stocked there and we have bred them and we are producing them and this mangrove foundation have identified beneficiaries and at present we are targeting thane raigad palgar and uh, sindudur district sindudur district we are targeting we have given hands on training and after that they established community aquaculture center see this is the unit these people this uh, thane district the people they have established for this the establishment and the other thing is taken care of by the mangrove foundation we are providing technical support so what we bred in our hatchery for uh, hatchery after after rearing one and half month we will be supplying to them they are rearing in their uh, system and after two months they are rearing they will be marketing so i am happy to share during this pandemic period they they are getting some small income so initially we have give supply them some 300 500 like that and they retaily sold them per fish 290 rupees the two and a half months reared fish they um, sold at the cost of uh, 290 uh, 290 rupees okay so that um, uh, so it is progressing well we have one unit in, in thane and five uh, operational unit in sindudur district now we are planning to establish more unit in uh, sindudur district and our intention is establishing a first marine ornamental village in sindudur uh, district for this clown fish okay uh, friends we are facing some issues with the what is called the disease and uh, some tail rot fin rot uh, so many issues we are facing with the different ornamental fishes not only with the clown fish initial days we have treated this fishes with some antibiotic later we have treated this fishes with this mangrove herbal you know that this mangroves the coastal plants so we have tried with this 
ரைசோ கைதியா அகலாக்கா திஸ் ரைசோ போரா அண்ட் அபிசீனியா பட் வி காட் அண்ட் எக்ஸலண்ட் ரிசல்ட் யூசிங் திஸ் எக்ஸோ கைதியா அகலாக்கா பிளான்ட் ஆக்சுவலி வாட் எவர் த இன்ஃபெக்டட் பீஸ் ட்ரீட்டட் வித் திஸ் எக்ஸோ கைதியா அகலாக்கா லேட்டக்ஸ் ஹேஸ் ஆக்சுவலி வி மிக்ஸ் த லேட்டக்ஸ் ஆஃப் திஸ் எக்ஸோ கைதியா அகலாக்கா வித் த ஃபீட் ஆஃப் கிளவுண்ட் ஃபிஷ் அண்ட் வி யூஸ் டு கிவிங் when we are giving feed to the clown fish we used to mix the latex with the feed and um, continuous feeding we um, done through this latex of exocadia agala and the f1 generation is this is free that is the most advantage thing of this mangrove uh, herbal so um, uh, this is um, uh, this finding we have flashed in the fish and shellfish uh, immunology magazine okay then this is the filtration system i told that we have sophisticated uh, Uh, instrument this is the canister filter the cost of this canister filter is 25000 in market but however we have developed the our own biological filtration system it cost just 500 rupees but it is uh, giving a promising result so you know that the excretory product of this fishes is ammonia it is the ammonia level is suppose if it is increasing automatically it it leads some infection and fish will get um, uh, mortality so what this filtration unit will be doing the uh, due to the continued filtration this nitrosomonas bacteria will grow so this nitrosomonas will convert the ammonia into nitrates and nitro factor will convert into nitrates so there is nit- uh, no harm so whatever the result given by this canister filter same result we are obtaining through our biological filtration made by our uh, filtration our project team just we are using some ceramic ring activated carbon some dead corals and like that we are using so instead of putting the aeration directly to the water we um, uh, we are inserting through a pipe and it is uh, recirculating the water okay so because our uh, aim is cost effective technology some low level technology we have to um, uh, develop and uh, transfer so th- then only this beneficiaries they will get uh, uh, some income so this is then um, uh, na- na- breeding and packing is not only en- um, uh, breeding and uh, culture is not only enough we have to packing and uh, pack and transport that is most important so um, uh, there also we have um, uh, developed some technology using this clove clove oil so clove is fact we have made and we have standardized standardized the technology for packing and transportation so and uh, 20 number of 2.5 to 3 cm uh, fishes in 1 liter water can survive without any stress for more than 48 hours so the same technology we have given to our uh, beneficiaries and they will be also adapting and the findings we have uh, flashed in aquaculture magazine so friends what uh, i have briefed so far is the work done in mainland by nbfgr now i will be briefing about the work we are carrying out by carrying out in lakshadweep islands lakshadweep islands you know that there are 36 islands scattered in arabian sea among the 36 island only 10 islands are inhabited their only population is there there is no actually livelihood only their livelihood is coconut as well as this uh, tuna catch so government of india department of biotechnology given as a uh, project and uh, p- developed technology for ornamental organisms and uh, hand, um, uh, of, uh, technical support for establishing beneficiary unit to enhance their income it is progressing well and i will be coming to the next slide and briefing the activities what we are doing at present see these all are the different uh, uh, aerial view of the islands friends actually with the financial support of Uh, department of biotechnology nbfgr has established the uh, jam blossom research center at agathi island of lakshadweep it is a two and a half years uh, old project a project at lakshadweep so for collecting the ornamental organisms we are adapting scuba diving snorkeling and so hand picking so whatever we will be collecting we will be shifting to our jam blossom resource center at agathi island so we have the shrimps more than uh, more than 20 species of shrimps falls under nine genera and seven families we are maintaining besides we have some uh, na, two three species of sea anemone so at present we have 635 
whilst collected shimp individual as well as 2300 captivated um, shimp what we have produced in captivity besides some uh, sea animal brood stock as well as uh, sea animals of wild collected as well as the captive is this available with us see these all are the shims uh, presently available in uh, our jam blossom uh, resource center mm. and uh, uh, they see how beautiful all these things so here i want to emphasize one or two species are new to science actually first time we have reported from uh, lakshadeep and uh, once uh, uh, this persilimella agathi since we have collected the animal from agathi island we named it as a agathi so persilimella agathi then the second second one you we named it as eurocardilla arabiensis because uh, this agathi island falls under this uh, Arab arabiensis so we named now our intention is we have to try to bring this two species into aquaculture ornamental aquaculture culture so we are the number one in because no this is newly newly described the discovered species from india so we are the um, number one for the supplier of this amount some experimental success we got but the however we will be working on that to enhancing the survival so some new distributional records also see this star geniensis some 3 years back it was reported in uh, saudi water but uh, second time we have reported from uh, lakshadeep and we published the out, uh, um, uh, result in zoo taxa and this uh, thor geniensis now we have standardized the technology and we are producing uh, young ones and we are supplying the same to our beneficiaries see this is the thor geniensis this is the young ones we have produced so we have standardized the young ones first slot we have given to the beneficiaries actually we are not giving our f1 generation to the beneficiaries we will be giving our f2 generation only uh, to our beneficiaries so it, it will be more hardy so there is no risk for the beneficiaries this is the second species brevi carpalis this also have a very good demand in aquarium trade so um, uh, at present we have more than 1500 young ones it will be supplied to the beneficiaries for community aquaculture shortly this is another one interesting shim called nathophila americanum so this is the first attempt in captive breeding in india and the international of course some um, uh, limited uh, success we have got we are still, uh, still working to upscale kill the population breeding population with the modification in rearing system and uh, uh, breeding um, um, uh, breeding technology and all friends the students those who are working in this projects they have registered for their phd's and all so they are documenting they are doing some scientific component also of course our main intention is lady good option however we will be working with this embryonic development resolver development feed formulation all these thing we are doing for their phd also so we are getting good publication also so this is about the hands on learning hands on training will be giving actually in lakshadweep the total population the 99.9 population is muslim populations so initially we have uh, taken some 50 beneficiaries and divided them into four batches and we have given two months rearing uh, training two months rearing so the icr institutes have a program called the tsp tribal sub plan program through that program we have given them some Uh, and uh, or is called the stipend to this beneficiaries as well to motivate them we have given stipend so we were with us for more than two months and we have given uh, hands on training and first they have established a community aquaculture unit at uh, lakshadeep and the first slot we have given some 300 the deputy collector of uh, agathi is giving the first slot and uh, they have uh, first slot they should told during april month uh, they asked us to uh, sell it before ramzan so the first slot they show uh sold and each beneficiary got 3000 rupees for their one, one and half months actually they are spending for just one hour or uh, half an hour or one hour for, per day but they are getting 3000 as a additional income now we have given the second slot and uh, breeding is going on then this is about the sea animal i told friends we have um, well established technology for clownfish but however we are collecting the sea animal from wild only 
But this um, on a sea anemone, it has the reproductive capacity, sexual or asexual reproduction. It is uh, um, uh, follow a sexual and asexually we can reproduce. So um, and, uh, for sexual reproduction, we are stuck this uh, sea anemone from the last two years. But uh, there is no progress, no spawning uh, we have got. But however, the, the, this have the regeneration capacity. Capacity. So we have adopted some dissection method. Initially, some uh, mortality was there. Now, later part, we have standardized and within three to three point five months, the dissected sea anemone got regenerated. So some we got official ethical clearance and all, and we have done. So yeah, this also we will be sup um, uh, supplying to the beneficiaries for the uh, um, uh, um, uh, further rearing and livelihood. So this is one interesting anemone, endakma quadricular this one we have got spawning and with these all are the juveniles we have produced in the captivity so this is the first report in india and international our project team we have uh, made in lakshad we will be publishing this finding shortly okay so friends actually the feed already magabhadra sir shown the feed material of food fishes uh, freshwater fish fishes likewise the same feed material we will be giving to the uh, ornamental organisms also the freshwater fishes are shown that uh, earthworm however in the marine we are giving this uh, uh, needed this polychid worm then this uh, artemia then acetus then prawn muscle if nothing is available what we are giving is meat but chicken mutton whatever is available or uh, when we are giving this um, uh, um, uh, meat, we used to boil with some turmeric powder and after that will be given. You know that it is turmeric antioxidant, so it will stimulate the disease resistant capacity. So, feed is not at, uh, not at all a matter. Whatever available with you, you can give, so it is easily accepted. Then, the live feed is the most important. For breeding, uh, live feed is most important. So, we have our own live feed facility in both the uh, facility, this nanochloropsis, isocrisis, all this uh, will be maintaining both stock culture as well as uh, mass culture. So friends, all the time it is very difficult to getting feed material, that live material. So we have developed some food materials using the local ingredients, local ingredients. Whatever available in Maharashtra that we are collecting, whatever available in Lakshadip that. So we have developed our own feed and we conducted some experimental. So our intention is at the end, we have to uh, come out with a package of practices for marine ornamental organism. So the uh, tra uh, trader, the hobbyist, he can easily adapt to this technology. So um, uh, now what the, how we can go uh, forward? Actually, we have to develop more cluster unit with the collaboration of local institute, NGOs. Now this National Fisheries Development Board, EMPIDA and NABAD, you all know. I have, uh, recently, the government of India launched a program, Prime Minister Matsya Sambada Yojana. Uh, the uh, total budget of the program is more than 20,000 crore. So this is the time for blue revolution. And already you know that India, we have succeeded with the white and the green revolution thanks to Professor Emma Swaminathan and thanks to Mr. Korean. So now this is the the time we have to work with the blue revolution of course we have a lot of resources i told freshwater and marine so through this government of india's program on pmmsy um, uh, we will be definitely succeeded uh, we, uh, succeeded in the coming days so the opportunities behind the ornamental aquaculture is low infrastructure less production cost woman friendly so these all are the opportunities However, we have facing some constraints also. When compared to food fish aquaculture, very limited research we have done in India. And uh, we have eight fisheries research institute working under ICR. However, there is um, uh, no separate institute for ornamental aquaculture. All the institute is working as an ancillary subject as a ornamental fishes for freshwater as, as well as. So that have to be overcome. So the current research status and the data is weak, no coordination between institutes. All these things will be uh, sought out, but definitely in the coming days, uh, it can be sought out. Okay. Then, lot of issues. 
actually ministry of environment and forest they are issuing orders uh, you are not allowed to keep fishes in home but however the ministry of Agri agriculture the national fisheries development they are giving subsidy to develop ornamental fish aquaculture then indian wildlife act biodiversity act so many things are there all are confusion mode only so all the um, uh, institute they have to come forward they have to uh, establish a coordination uh, committee or something like that and if you jointly work definitely india will succeed that with the blue revolution so the need of the avaries the there is a national quarantine facility friends actually you know that the shrimp the um, uh, this um, uh, earlier we done the aquaculture with this pinnace monodon it has gone due to vena due to this virus now the venami almost anami is also in the uh, moving stage but whatever the venami coming from abroad brooders we have a national quarantine facility in uh, chennai rajiv gandhi center for aquaculture after quarantine only they will be supplying uh, the same they will be forwarding to the hatcheries however in the ornamental they are directly taking to their uh, hub and immediately supplying this should be avoided for that we need a very good national quarantine facility in east coast of course one or two one in east coast and one one in west coast so we can come, uh, come uh, solve all these issues so uh, this is the, the protocol we have developed actually for value and supply chain we will not be disturbing the wild population of course we are collecting wild population and we are doing ex situ as well as in situ uh, conservation uh, we will be raising uh, the juveniles f1 from the f1 we will be bring out the f2 and f2 is going to the beneficiaries as well as the market so that is the nbfgr protocol so in, even we are not uh, supplying the f1 f, f2 generation it will be already it is being practiced for this two species shrimps so organian shrimps and brave carpalis we are trying to bring out the f2 generation for these two species in lakshadweep uh, sorry uh, maharashtra perkula and ocellaris so friends this is the working model actually the wild collected animal will get young ones within 35 days we, um, uh, we will be revering for 35 to 50 days on 50 days we will be supplying to the beneficiaries they will be rearing it Uh, for uh, for um, uh, further more days and 120 days it will be going to market but in the case of f2 generation it will be taking little more time the uh, from f1 to f2 it is taking 160 days likewise this um, brief carpal is also it is taking 170 days now we will be working for reducing this uh, uh, production of f2 generation so once it will be some 130 days 140 days for uh, 150 days for brief carpal is it will be easier their job so we'll be working on that so shortly i have the hope will be work out so this is about that i told that pmmsi scheme uh, uh, recently government launched so lot of scope is there so we can utilize this uh, uh, opportunity and we have to develop this sector are in the country so these all are the some um, media appreciation and all thank you very much friends thank you very much uh, for the kind opportunity and uh, this thing actually our um, uh, system our system is behind the product publication you know that uh, na, if you are publishing paper and if you are um, na, uh, produ uh, filing pattern and all we will get uh, uh, what is called this promotion job and all this thing but my intention is at least our science should feed a poor fisherman that is a great satisfaction to us so with this i will be winding my presentation so if any queries you can feel free and ask me otherwise you can whatsapp me on this number and mail to me once again i will take this opportunity to thanking the uh, magavatra sir uh, for uh, given me the link with this college and uh, i uh, taking this opportunity to uh, thanking the college authorities and organizers they included me as a uh, board of studies member for their view of program and finally last but least I am th uh, uh, thanking Deepa, uh, my friend, for uh, given cosmetic uh, touch to my presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, sir. I'm sure we can take a lot of information from this lecture.
sir we have a question yeah yes please sir the question is like if we want to maintain sea horse aquariums yeah. in a department or college sir then do we have to have any permission for that yeah, yeah, yeah yes legally any permission do we need sir? yes 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 it is not permitted of course you can write to the director general wildlife of ministry of environment and forest Sir, uh, it same goes for live corals also, sir. Can we keep live yes, corals? Yes, definitely. Yeah, definitely. Live corals, actually, we have two types of coral. Soft coral and hard coral. Uh, soft coral, no issue. It is not in the schedule. Soft coral, you can maintain. But hard coral, you should get permission. Okay. Otherwise, even, uh, even if you are uh, keeping some dead coral, the forest department can uh, take legal action. For such a purpose also, they are troubling us. Okay, okay. But so, okay. lots of illegal things are seen, this mining activities and the cement industry, they are uh, um, uh, taking coral and they are using. But uh, for such a purpose, they are <laughs> telling so many rules and other things. Okay, sir. Okay. Thank you so much, sir. Now I would like to call upon Professor Beauty Sarkar to introduce Dr. Goradhur Das. So, we am I audible and visible? If you're audible, you are visible, yes. Okay, thank you, Shobhi. Thank you. Good afternoon, all. It's my great pleasure to introduce our respected speaker, Dr. Badadar Dash, who will be giving us a short presentation on the recent advances in fish and stream health management, holds a PhD FCDSI, Faculty of Department of Aquatic Animal Health, Faculty of Fishery Science, West Bengal University of Animal and Fishery Science, Top Korea. He has received many awards, namely ICA Junior Fellowship Award in the year 1990 and University Gold Medal Award in the year 1993. He has published more than 100 national articles, three well-known books on fish pathology and five manuals. We all would definitely listen to the webinar about the recent advances in fish and stream health management from Dr. Vadadar Dash. So, without much delay, I welcome Dr. Vadadar Dash to deliver his valuable speech and enrich us. Thank you. Welcome, sir. Thank you, madam. Madam, I am audible. Yes, sir. Audible. Just some netting. Thank you. 
हेलो मैडम यस सर यस सर हमारे विजिबल एंड ऑडिबल यस सर यस विजिबल एंड ऑडिबल यस सर नाउ यस ओके थैंक यू थैंक यू ओके गुड आफ्टरनून टू ऑल आर रेस्पेक्टेड वाइस प्रिंसिपल ऑफ द कॉलेज एंड अदर डिग्नेटरीज ऑफ द कॉलेज माय हेलो एक्सपर्ट्स हु हैव डिलीवर्ड इन द फर्स्ट हाफ एंड डियर स्टूडेंट्स हु आर लिसनिंग डायरेक्टली एंड हु आर हु आर अंडर द यूट्यूब स्ट्रीमिंग so friends i am going to discuss uh, about the recent advances in peace and sustainable management for sustainable agriculture for the coming one hour around so when you think about this uh, health management and sustainable agriculture we cannot think of sustainable agriculture without or ignoring the health management okay so aquaculture will be sustainable if we take due care to the fish health in the first half we have heard about the culture aspects particularly seed of uh, different indigenous species as well as the marine resources also marine aquariums but uh, this we are going to talk about the health aspects of fishes then when we will talk about this say, aquaculture then the question comes sustainability and the health management let us come just one hello yes sir just one minute some problem some net yeah so when we will talk about uh, aquaculture and uh, then the question comes sustainability next why aquaculture why everybody is now before the aquaculture so if you will think about that question or that uh, important slogan aquaculture and aquaculture then perhaps it is uh, for this reason you see one graph i am showing that is around 10 to 12 kg of feed is required to produce 1 kg of beef and around 4 to 5 kg of feed is required to produce 1 kg of beef pork and hardly 1 to 1.5 kg of feed is required to produce 1 kg of fish for us this is more than sufficient to understand the importance of aquaculture and if you think about the emissions particularly nitrogen and the phosphorus emissions or metabolites nitrogenous metabolites you see cattle is the top one producing highest emission and followed by pigs followed by poultry then pig uh, then the fish and last the bivalves so the organisms the bait animals which are consuming more feed they are emitting more amount of nitrogen and its metabolic products okay creating more pollution so around <clears throat> now the entire world is hungry after this protein particularly this animal protein and fish is the cheapest source of animal protein to suffice this protein hunger people of the world now around 650 crores of people of the world are there and around 140 crores people in india and it has been estimated that by 2030 to 50 9 to 10 billion people will depend upon this aquaculture mostly and uh, there will be global growth of around 6% in the last decade and the global demand for seafood will be 261 million tons so let us talk about the per capita consumption of fish and fishery products if you think about the india's per capita fish and fish product fishery products consumption is around 12.0 kg where at china it is 26.1 kg and india's is per capita consumption is being oscillating from 11.5 kg per annum to 16.7 
16.7, which is being estimated by 2030, hmm, it will be oscillated with this. So we have to increase our per capita consumption of uh, this piece. Okay. So next, if we'll go for this uh, species culture, around 580 species of uh, fishes are being cultured. Uh, so among these 580 species, 362 fin fishes are there, 100 four molluscs are there, 62 crustaceans, six frogs and reptiles, nine aquatic vertebrates, and 37 aquatic plants are there. So much veracity, so much diversity of the species. And among these top 12 aquaculture producers, again, we'll see China is the highest producing 49.2 million tons, amounting around 144.7 billion US dollar, whereas India produced only 5.7 million tons and earning about 10.6 billion US dollars. The question may come, why and how China is able to produce so much and so high? The answer may be China is having all the facilities. They have all sorts of automations. They have very much innovative technology which they are, and their adoption skill, adoption technology, adoption uh, level is very high compared to India. Okay, that's why China is in the first, particularly in aquaculture sector. And if you think about the global aquaculture productions, it is the total is around 111.95 million metric tons. And uh, this is the source from FAO by 2019, and out of which this, uh, again, the freshwater fishes uh, dominates, that is 44.66 metric tons, MMT and followed by these aquatic plants. And let us come to the uh, aquaculture sector, particularly aquaculture sector is a very dynamic sector and fragile sector, and it is also a very location specific. If you think about aquaculture, and uh, particularly India, we are being bestowed with the huge resources. We have marine resources. We have brackish water resources. We have estuarines. We have creeks. We have reservoirs, rivers, we have bills, berries, ponds, tanks, and we have very much innovative farmers. We can do wonder. We are bestowed with several resources. We are blessed with several resources. And our farmers have very much innovative technology or very much innovative idea also. Actually, this triangle, uh, this uh, uh, circular dry diagram which I have shown, this is a model given by SNISCO in the year 1974 regarding the genesis of uh, digits. Here, this host pathogen and the environment interaction leads to the disease. If the equilibrium, if they are, that is in the equilibrium, there will be no such occurrence of disease. If the equilibrium is little lost, then there is possibility of occurrence of disease. I will tell you how the disease occurs and uh, what is the problem, what are the factors or drivers how it is affecting the digits and that. With regard to diseases, various types of diseases are there. Maybe infectious diseases, maybe non-infectious diseases, maybe environmental diseases, parasitic diseases, obligatory diseases, maybe viral diseases, emergency diseases, bacterial diseases, exotic diseases, opportunistic diseases, and several other types of diseases are there. Then, if we think about these diseases, then of particularly infectious in nature, then it, will, it can be categorized into three groups, that is exotic, endemic and emerging. And with regard to exotic diseases, that is diseases that are very much important to treat. Actually, with regard to exotic diseases, let me tell how it is coming, how it is coming. Our country, India, is sharing its border with three main countries like China, Bangladesh, as well as uh, Nepal. And we have porous borders also. There is every chance of uh, contamination, every chance of transfer of these the, uh, pathogens through these aquatic animals to our country. And we are also importing the uh, uh, live pieces. We are also exporting the live pieces. We are also exporting the streams. We are also importing several other things. So it is a trade-oriented business. It is a trade-oriented business. And through this trade, various pathogens, they are coming to our systems. And our pathogenic list is increasing day by day. And uh, these pathogens are being governed by several factors. Okay. And with regard to endemic diseases, 
we have our own hatchery nursery grow out systems where the bacterial parasites fungal and viruses are there and there we have several several types of diseases starting from ulcer till to viral diseases so several types of indigenous diseases are there which are endemic to our systems also with regard to emerging diseases which are very much uh, new to the geographical areas and new susceptible species are there and many unknown etiologies are there many emerging diseases are being reported suppose i'll tell you three main uh, this uh, emerging diseases have uh, very recently reported one is serpent herpes virus 2 another is killer pellic virus and another is imnv infectious myonecosis virus in case of hanami so these are the different diseases of infectious in nature in aquaculture then we will let us discuss about the fish health status so is it okay visible madam hello 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 i am audible sir i want yes, to respond yes, sir so you are audible so you are audible You are audible. Okay. Yeah, audible and visible okay. both. Yes. Okay. So fish cell status. So uh, a, when we talk about this fish cell status, it is being governed by several components. The different components may uh, are host, facilities, environment, nutrition, pathogen, and physiological status. If you think about host, again host we will consider from species wise, age, and strain, and facilities. how we are handling how what is the density and what type of designs we are making for this culture and with regard to environment we will consider about the organic load water quality and its a uh, temperature mainly and with regard to nutrition uh, we are uh, it is related to schedule quantity and quality pathogens what type of strain it is and uh, what type strain and species and with regard to physiological status uh, natural resistance and acquired immunity so this all combinedly governs the health status of the species so next we will go for this say uh, climate change and aquaculture this is a very important aspects climate change nowadays climate has a uh, very pivot uh, is playing a pivotal role in spreading the diseases and uh, in causing several types of diseases one such important disease is the us epidemic also this syndrome i will give you the best example they say uh, monsoon is going to over and the winter is coming at that time one important disease that is us epidemic also this syndrome will uh, appear in almost all the ponds starting from morel still to the uh, uh, carps it will affect almost uh, all the fishes and it will be available in the ponds tanks reservoirs and the rivers also so it is causing the problem and mainly it is temperature dependent and uh, besides this us also now several uh, this uh, temperature related issues are coming so due to the thermal informations in the um, reservoirs or in the ponds having a little high depth and uh, there will be mass mortality of the fishes mass mortality of the fishes are being reported by the farmers in several uh, regions all in a sudden the mass mortality is be there and particularly at uh, smaller stages i uh, thigh and finger link it is being reported in a very high rate and that is the impact of climate and with regard to the factors leading to the discovery of new and emerging aquatic animal diseases it is the first one is coming the increased aquaculture productions so our aim we are greedy enough to increase the productions we are greedy enough to increase the productions because we want to increase the productions without thinking its sustainability without thinking anything else we want more and more productions we want more and more price and with that what we are doing we are expanding the range of new farm aquatic animals we are to increase the productions to increase the diversity of the species and what we are doing we are uh, culturing the new new species without studying its uh, biology without studying its uh, feeding habit without st studying its uh, details about it suppose amur suppose uh, this pirana suppose uh, many other species are there now pengba so many species are being cultured okay besides this all this uh, marine animals like uh, halibut arctic char stubble fish atlantic cod crustaceans etc so without studying their proper biology we are culturing them and with new production approaches also again we are following several new approaches like bioflux systems by like rs systems so we we have list idea we have very conservative idea about that and we are going we are immediately jumping many of these unemployed youths now they are jumping to the bioflux rs systems they are getting plugged or uh, they are getting failed so again they are being frustrated 
now regarding improved diagnostic and surveillance reports that is very important we are uh, our diagnostic uh, uh, diagnostics has been improved like anything you know this uh, you think about corona uh, corona virus more, more and more diagnosis they are then we get uh, more and more reports positive or negative okay so similarly the improved diagnostics will leads to the um, detection of pathogens in a very high rate and with regard to surveillance let me tell you uh, this uh, surveillance uh, system has been adopted by the, the year 2010 the government of india has realized the importance of surveillance and it was there in case of uh, veterinary sectors but it was not there in aquaculture sectors by the pressure of oi office Inter international epigenetics and naca government of india is compelled to made an surveillance uh, team or surveillance system in the country that has been operated from 2010 and uh, in fact it was taken a step in 2013 first time in india and uh, now at least a, a very big mega project national surveillance program for aquatic animal diseases under nfdb national uh, fisheries development board uh, so that is in operation at least 32 centers are uh, uh, joining their hands uh, to um, in this surveillance program in the uh, and they are reporting and uh, fortunately we are one part of uh, them and the with this the uh, surveillance systems we are uh, going for active and passive surveillance we are reporting uh, this compilation zonation strategies to combat this many times suppose uh, any mortality will be there mass mortality will be there government of india is making the task force to evaluate to what is being happened to a particular place and sending the experts to bring the samples and uh, to immediately uh, work upon it to work upon it so now enter india enter aquaculture system is under strict surveillance so that is a, that is true and that is taken into account next we will go for spreading the aquatic animal diseases if you think about the this the aquatic different types of diseases aquatic uh, animal diseases then it is uh, the first one is white spot syndrome in case of shrimp then taura syndrome gyrodactyla species uh, particularly um, uh, parasites then sleeping sickness disease then ehn virus epigenetic hematopoietic necrosis virus then uh, spring barium in carps koi apis virus then infectious salmon anemic diseases in case of atlantic salmon mm. so it has be, it is uh, these are the leading diseases which are uh, causing problems to the aquatic animals if you think about this aquatic animal disease this is governed by this oe and uh, this oe is the uh, this uh, mm, office international, uh, international epigenetics which uh, headquarter is paris it is the world governing body for uh, mm, identifications and which is responsible for different types of diseases uh, in case of aquatic animals and they have listed some of these diseases which are of uh, e uh, commercially important and uh, economical uh, economic concern and uh, with that that is epigenetic hematopoietic necrosis epigenetic ulcerative syndrome gyrodactylosis infectious hematopoietic necrosis infectious salmon anemia then koi herpes virus uh, and like this spring virus i mean car viral uh, viral hemorrhagic septicemia then molluscan diseases and among the crustacean diseases we have this particularly taura syndrome white spot disease white tail diseases and the yellow head diseases then amphibian diseases are there besides this oa listed diseases and i was telling about this uh, nasport program at that time all the pathologists of for this nations they have uh, sat together and they, they have also find out besides this uh, oa listed diseases they have listed out some of the diseases of national concern and among these diseases of national concern uh, this among the fin fish diseases that is bkd bacterial kid disease channel catfish virus disease as well as uh, streptococcus inai amoeba eagle disease then your ergal uh, salus mm, uh, disease argulosis and mixoboliasis several other these fin fish diseases are there and also crustacean diseases among that uh, speri uh, spherical baculovirus disease tetrahedral baculovirus disease then microsporiasis and uh, these are uh, they have considered it as uh, of national concern and they have taken into account and uh, they are working up on it also they are working up on it and next what are the tags and transboundary aquatic animal diseases this transboundary aquatic animal diseases as i have told you we have shared our uh, this uh, porous border uh, among these three different countries and also uh, there is a huge chance heavy chance of trans uh, uh, transfer of these pathogens transfer of pathogens and it is highly contagious and transmissible also and the potential for very rapid spread and irrespective of the national borders 
there is no passport for these pathogens. Uh, okay, there is no passport for the pathogens. The pathogens can be transported along with the organisms. Okay, uh, cause serious uh, socioeconomic losses, socioeconomic uh, losses, and possibly the health cons uh, consequences. Okay, so OI has listed about 30 aquatic different uh, pathogens and, uh, and diseases which is fit to be established criteria for listed diseases. Okay, one of the negative impact of the trade globalizations is uh, the, this is the important pathway because when you will think about the uh, globe as a village okay and uh, that is transfer of path uh, transfer of uh, this uh, aquatic animal disease from one corner of the globe to another corner of the globe and by the time they are transferring of course we have uh, designed the laboratory world class laboratories are the uh, this uh, our uh, entry points but uh, it is not full place till now um, it is not full place till now i will tell you about that uh, how we are failing okay then examples of tarts i will tell you that is epigenetic ulcerative syndrome, pila pelic virus, acute hepatopancreatic necrosis virus, ASPND, infectious myonecrosis virus, IMNV, then Q herpes virus. Let us talk about the EUS epigenetic ulcerative syndrome, which has started its journey in 1972 from this. Uh, 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 it has started from uh, this uh, Thailand, then now it has reached in Africa. And they, so many school of thoughts, so many scientists they are given so many. Uh, it is uh, they say they, the carrier is bad. Some are carrier, some are telling that the carrier is the uh, water. So, however, we have now river linking process. So, if that is the case, then transfer of this uh, EU is type of disease is very common, will be very common. And you know, this EU is second, uh, this uh, backbone of fisheries industry in 1990s. 1990s. And after then, now so many curative measures have been developed. Of course, a very good medicine has been developed by CIPA, and uh, that is called CIPAX. And the dose is one liter per hectometer. Somewhat it controls the EUS. Besides that, uh, gradually it has uh, taken its uh, natural mortality. Now, fishes has developed uh, the immune systems against this EUS. Similarly, Tilapelic like virus are found on IMNB, uh, IMNB and KSB also now uh, in the very active states. Okay. So let us talk about some drivers and factors which are affecting the emergent diseases in aquaculture. If you will think about this, uh, what are the factors responsible for this emergent type of diseases in aquaculture? It's, I have told you already that uh, it is a highly traded commodity and around 70% exposed to international trade. So almost all our aquaculture trade is the, of uh, this uh, international concerns. And uh, hyper diverse species, around 580 species already we have talked. So, so much diversifications, it is very difficult. <coughs> it is very difficult to have control over all different species and different, and it is sporadic in nature. It is the farms are isolated in nature also. And, and we are dealing with live animals, particularly we, we are dealing with larvae, fry, adults, and their products also, live pieces. Many species farm outside of native range also. Okay. Then ornamental aquaculture trade is large and growing. Yes. Ornamental pieces. We are importing the ornamental pieces, and we are also exporting the ornamental pieces. And we do not have that much that that much stringent mechanism to go for uh, this uh, strong quarantine before it is uh, importing or before it is being exporting uh, exported. Okay. So these are some of these problems where there is possibility of occurrence of the uh, possibility of transfer of pathogens, and they are leading to different SODGs. Some of the drivers and factors are. This is a unique aquatic medium. Actually, aquaculture system is a unique aqua aquatic medium. The moment you drop one, uh, this, uh, one drop of medicines in one corner of the pond, very next moment it, it can reach to the next moment. It's a very good uh, conductive medium. So, and uh, it's so a collective awareness uh, of new threats. So, new, new days, uh, every day we are getting new threats from aquaculture sites. Okay. And lack of basic pathogen, we do not have uh, a particular pathogen list. But uh, after this uh, formation of this Nasmut program, now we are uh, going to develop uh, through the help of Nivedi. Um, uh, we are going to develop a list of pathogens which are being encountered in India or in national basis. And a lack of host data also. So we do not have a clear cut uh, this host data. And uh, diagnostic focused and known and uh, listed diseases. Then breeding strategies say, is not in a place for many species, particularly SPF, SPR, and selective breeding. 
and particularly we are uh, we are depending upon all these spa spr and spt stocks from rgca rajiv gandhi center for agriculture chennai but many cases also misuse of stock of this spa stocks are there and i uh, will give you some of these uh, these uh, websites uh, how you can know that whether spa stocks are available in rgca or not i will uh, give, give you that in one slide then uh, limited availability of vaccines are there. also our country only very few vaccines are there only very very few vaccines are there and that to uh, that to it is only meant for these uh, temperate countries not tropical countries okay so again social barriers are innovative uh, uh, we have several social taboos social stigmas okay and they, they in aquaculture sector many places they are not allowing to put uh, lime put medicines put uh, drugs or put uh, different species so many types of uh, social stigmas are there also you know societal barriers in agriculture also they are gmo genetically modified organisms like beet cotton or brinjals you know several problems in maharashtra region also they are this is a one on problem just i am citing then some other drivers and factors which are responsible multiple institutions are involved in asm we do not have a competent authority till uh, till some years ago at least uh, we are in human sector we are following uh, this uh, uh, food and drug administration of us but in this aquaculture sectors we do not have regulatory authority but of course in the latter phase uh, by 2015 to 16 this uh, caa coastal aquaculture authority as well as fasai has uh, come that uh, in delhi so they are at least regulating these uh, drugs and because now drugs companies are increasing day by day and uh, many prevalent drugs are also uh, floating in the market then inadequate and poorly implemented biosecurity measures we do not have also strict biosecurity measures with that we are culturing the feces so that sort of things are also lacking Incons- inconsistent and weak implementation of international standards again we are not able to me- meet the international standards uh, very thoroughly okay for that what we are doing we are sending our product to, uh, to the uh, uh, countries where we are receiving very less amount of money like vietnam thailand etc but we are unable to meet the standards of us and japan where we can get a little higher price in case of shrimp okay so these are some of these problems next we will go some other drivers like physiological conditions in aquaculture and upon sub uh, they say are upon uh, the suboptimum for host see these physiological conditions are very important you think about all these different parameters of the water uh, parameters of water and soil that also we are unable to uh, meet uh, uh, meet its optimal standards because uh, we are not able to uh, uh, our farmers are not uh, able enough to maintain it uh, because of several factors maybe cost factor maybe knowledge factor maybe several other things so then another thing is that aquatic animals are cold blooded which are very much responsible to different types of stressors like physical stressors chemical stressors biological stressors and procedural stressors so these stressors are causing problem to the aquatic animals uh, very high rate then and this uh, this is in a nutshell about the drivers and factors which are affecting and they, then what we can do with whether we will go for prevention or we will go for solution whether we will take for a proactive approach or we will go for reactive approach okay you will think about this pre- uh, prevention solutions always the proverb that is prevention is better than cure always true so you see this one pebble is taking the load of three pebbles okay how it is possible this is because of this equilibrium so our steps should be prevention and proactive approach is always better than the solution and reactive approaches this prevention and proactive approach is uh, less costly than the solution and reactive approach which is costly okay so stitch in time saves nine that formula is always good and that principle we should ad- adopt in all the cases so we should prevent and unless until it is warranted we should not go for treatment let us think about managing the risks at all levels of the aquaculture chain whether it is a hazard and critical point at farm facility whether the value chain risk management whether the biosecurity governance and national regional and international level all the cases uh, the risks will be there that those risks uh, um, are to be managed at a hatchery level nursery level grow at level processing plants and even markets then and there only we can uh, have a sustainable aquaculture systems let us talk about the diagnosis 
then if you will think about the diagnosis there are three different types of diagnosis are there one is level 1 level 2 level 3 and what is level 1 what is level 2 almost all our different laboratories are the colleges are institutes are there that is under level 1 level 2 in level 1 we have gross observations clinical observations and some microscopic observations etc and in level 2 we have histopathology we have hematology and we have uh, this a uh, bacteriology and uh, we have mycology all these units this is uh, normal uh, this uh, procedural works we are doing day to day activities in the laboratory that is coming under level 2 and level 3 we have uh, this the facilities so where it is available molecular methods like pcr in situ hybridizations then um, rt pcr q pcr and hsn sequencing all these things uh, they, that is that will come under level 3 in india hardly three four laboratories have been uh, detected as uh, level 3 having level 3 facilities like cfa cpri ciba and uh, um, rgca cfri cip like the, uh, like this and actually the ca coastal aquaculture authority fasi they are depending upon this level three, level 3 laboratories and uh, some oi refer laboratories they are in chennai also that is the uh, hakim pet college and uh, they are also uh, they are depending upon this and to uh, um, analyze the different products uh, given by these uh, different companies and uh, also uh, seeing the different activities in a in a very narrow level in a very nano or micro level let us come to the fundamentals of these transmissions so we should uh, see who is the culprit whether the fish is culprit whether the insect is culprit whether the uh, shrimp is culprit or what is culprit who is culprit we should see in the eye of a doctor in a very strict eye we, we have to find out what is the root reason for this cause of disease unless until we will know the root we cannot eradicate it that we should look in the eye of a doctor we should look in the eye of a scientist to the fish culture systems or the, the, uh, to the fish species or shrimp species then and there only you can find out some way out to solve the issue then if we we'll think about that we have to see whether this uh, fish movement where the fish has come the incoming of the fish whether the eggs we have brought whether the fry fingerling etc we have to see the water resources we have to check the health of the fishes we have to see the equipments and vehicles used for transmission for transport of these fishes we have to see the vectors we have to see whether the same uh, molluscan hosts are there or not so all these things we have to see and check thoroughly and uh, carefully so that uh, before giving any conclusive remarks that we should be able to we should uh, we should check all those things next transmission if you will think about transmission one is horizontal transmission another is vertical transmission horizontal transmission is transmission between the individual fish fish to fish or one farm to other farm or one area to other area and the equipments various types of equipments used in that area might be nets might be vehicles might be might be different utensils also vertical transmissions between the generations from parents to offspring and this vertical transmission mainly through the fecal matter maybe through the sex products particularly through the eggs through the seeds so it will from parents to offspring it will come most of these hereditary diseases are due to these vertical transmissions and this horizontal most of these infectious diseases and non infectious diseases mainly due to these horizontal transmissions so if we think about the health control in aquaculture we have to improve the nutrition we have to use the probiotics we have to use the immunostimulants we have to improve the disease resistance quality control of water seed and feed use of immunostimulants mm. and rapid detection of pathogens is very much essential also then diagnostic kits if, uh, first we have to screen the pathogens we have to screen the different pieces then the pathogens then we have to go for the this diagnostic tests in the laboratory then if you think about the historically overview of this laboratory diagnosis from culture based assays to nuclear study our diagnosis has changed a paradigm of shifting up this technology paradigm of shifting up technology so earlier we have this culture gram stains biochemical analysis serological analysis etc we have microscopic analysis mycological analysis we have histopathology hematology now the same things along with that we are adding that all this uh, nucleic acid uh, 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 nucleic acid based diagnostic that is um, pcr rt pcr q pcr then your uh, next gen sequencing microarrays all these things so this is a uh, more conforming and more precise more sensitive this is more cons- uh, and also within short span of time is giving more accurate result more accurate result now you know in corona also 
mostly we are depending upon the rt pcr results rt pcr results so similarly in case of fees also many this uh, sensitive diseases many important diseases we are depending upon the rt pcr and t pcr or we are de depending upon the micro or results also okay so how this detection of pathogens so i have already told you this is morphological and traditional methods that is culture histology from that also we are able to diagnose okay this thing has happened with that this histology this uh, plates uh, this uh, petri plates etc and uh, this uh, and uh, clinical observations gross observations with that also we are prescribing earlier now then followed by that uh, that immunological or serological methods have been developed elisa dot blots and uh, western blots uh, things have been developed and followed by that again the molecular methods like uh, dna sequencing like uh, your uh, pcr rt pcr already i have told you those things and also bioinformatics has come into picture now we are able to uh, forecast the disease now we are also making the disease calendars at the what time disease may occur and which area it may occur also so these are the developments but to my mind it is the combination of both the methods like traditional methods or these old methods as well as the new nucleic acid diagnosis methods are very much visible but one thing the methods need to be robust and it to be sensitive so we should not compromise with the diagnosis once the diagnosis is and there is a big no 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 to this can be may be likely to be so we should have concrete result we should have concrete result concrete result then and there only we should go for treatments okay examples of different novel technology with potential you uh, western blots i have told you dot blots western blots etc then molecular tests like real time pcr nucleic acid sequence based amplification that is the nasba and nested pcr then uh, rt pcr q pcr etc and other hybridization technology is uh, in situ hybridization technology is also there so these are the different and micro rh is also new uh, these uh, novel technologies so these sort of things are being used nowadays to for confirmatory tests and if you think about this immuno chromatography we have paper chromatography liquid chromatography um, and which is very much uh, this user friendly and also very much specific and sensitive and rapid also for identifying this uh, infectious salmon anemic viral disease also and various other diseases in our country also so this is the one uh, the use of monoclonal antibody and polyclonal antibody are also being used for identification of this uh, isa that is infectious salmon anemic disease and also now in our country also monoclonal and polyclonal antibodies are being used for various purposes let us talk about this nanotechnology also this nanotechnology has taken a pivotal role in case of detection of disease and they also uh, uh, in disease sector particularly the various uh, this nanomaterials like silver gold nickel tungsten copper lead titanium oxides and aluminum oxides are being used as the nanopartikel various drug companies various medicinal companies now they are using nano products or nano based things okay nano sachets are available now to improve or to boost up the plankton levels to plankton levels you see these are these different uh, they say uh, uh, they say nano particles and you know nano has replaced uh, many of these medicines and now very less amount of medicines are being required for curing the diseases okay so the different practical applications of nanotechnology aquaculture the sterilization funds water treatment waste water remediations detection and control of aquatic diseases disinfection detoxification and monitoring all those things are being now nano based organizations performance health in terms of vaccinations drug delivery monitoring antimicrobial applications are also now nano based reproduction control and functional feeding efficient uh, de delivery of nutrients are also nano based harvested fish manufacturing preservation packing in all cases now nano materials are nano machines are available and these nano materials are being placed in the nano machines to produce this uh, nano size particles and they uh, it is being studied in various way then they are being used for these different types of activity okay so 
Next, another important uh, thing is the biosensors as a peace health assessment tool. This is a very good thing. Different types of biosensors are there. Electric, uh, this, uh, electrical biosensors, chemical biosensors, these uh, optimal based biosensors, as well as uh, these uh, optical biosensors are there. You know, one drop of urine uh, is sufficient enough to say the pregnancy level. And uh, one drop of blood is sufficient enough to say the, uh, this, uh, uh, your glucose level or blood sugar level and various other blood parameters also. Similarly, now, this uh, biosensor, th those are uh, used by the biosensor kits. Various types of kits are available now. Similarly, these biosensor kits are now available for identifying different pathogens, bacteria, as well as the pesticides. You will be happy to know that, uh, uh, that our, our Sida, Sida Kolkata, Sipri Barakpur and IIT Hyderabad, they are coming together to uh, develop one biosensor. Of course, the biosensors have already been developed. Um, developed and uh, through that, they are able to identify certain specific uh, pesticides as well as certain specific bacteria like Aromonas baroni and many other species also. And uh, fortunately, I am part of that program uh, in that uh, biosensor development. Already it has been developed and it is going to be tested in Assam. We have requested them to test also in the very of West Bengal. Okay. So just a miniature model has to be come to the front and it is the, it will be utilized for practical purposes. And I hope within short span of time, short span of years, uh, we will get our uh, this, uh, biosensors, particularly the kids for identifying various uh, bacteria or uh, for identifying various uh, these, uh, pesticides in, uh, in the spot itself or in the field itself. Next, we'll go for laboratory diagnostic tests like uh, we have to go for screening, surveillance. And then we'll go for discovery of uh, pathogen detections. Then we'll go for uh, this confirmatory uh, tests uh, through this uh, PCR or RT-PCR. Then multiplex PCR we are using also. So these are the different laboratory diagnostic tests. Then um, uh, this, uh, <coughs> the different serological tests uh, are uh, being done. Uh, I have already told you that uh, this uh, ELISA and uh, Western blots, dot blots, so these are all of the serological tests. And uh, they say they, uh, this is also giving a very accurate result, accurate result, uh, other like that of other molecular methods. Okay. So with regard to fish vaccines, I have already told you, 900, uh, they say fish vaccines, so mostly they, they are being developed in the temperate countries, in tropical countries, their numbers are very few. And uh, in 1982, we had on, uh, hardly two vaccines. Now, by 2007, we have 26 vaccines, but all these vaccines are only for temperate countries. Our vaccines are not being developed because our country, it, we are not, uh, we have, we do not have, the, we are not of that economic states. And uh, uh, these commercial vaccines uh, mean for peace that uh, the economic benefits, environmental benefits, and animal welfare benefits. These vaccines are mostly used in Norway, Sweden, because they have all automation facility and they are economically sound also they are population is less and they are also they are stocking very less and all automatic throw automations they are able to vaccinate almost all these pieces we are unable to vaccinate our people forget about the pieces so so this uh, some of these uh, lacunas or some problems are there so it's also not so easy to develop a vaccines you see, vaccines say uh, simply not an easy to develop a vaccine, need to identify the protective other. It is like a finding a needle in the haystack. Okay. So, you know, they say already two years has uh, taken for developing a vaccine against corona. The whole world scientists are there before this to develop a vaccine, but it is not so easy task also. It is cost effective and it is costly, and also it needs a lot of uh, these uh, experiments. And then and there only it's, it will come to the market. And regarding vaccine technology, we have the simple, uh, they say, um, uh, inactivated vaccines, recombinant vaccines, virus like particles vaccines, live modified vaccines. We have DNA vaccines and gene silencing, live modified vaccines like your co vaccines, etc. So, uh, so these are, these are the different uh, types of uh, vaccine technology is available and uh, we can follow it also. And uh, our scientists, they are trying, but uh, till now it has not been commercialized. So many vaccines are not being commercialized. Okay. And with regard to general challenges faced by the diagnostic labs for aquatic animal diseases, particularly availability of uh, these uh, sick aquatic animals, particularly the samples. So the samples uh, should be available in a plenty way uh, at the laboratory. And how the samples will be transported from the field to the laboratory, it is also more important. Okay. 
so our this uh, technicians or our farmers are not adequate and or they do not have adequate uh, knowledge how to transport uh, this uh, samples uh, for viral study or how to tra transport uh, samples for uh, various other molecular study so this is a this is a great setback this is a great setback um, for particularly for these uh, diagnostic labs then also positive controls are expensive and not easy to get particularly for specific diagnostic challenges okay so positive controls are also costly next we will go for preventive health management and with regard to preventive health management we have bmps best man better, uh, better management practices code of conduct then uh, good agriculture practices then biosecurity governance so if you think about this preventive health management we have to consider all these four components different components and uh, with regard to this uh, preventing the entry of infectious agents if you think then we we have to think about the disease free stocks like your spf stock spr stocks and uh, selective breeding stocks or spt stocks so from this sp uh, stocks also we can think of these management points pond preparation maintain the water quality good nutrition uh, feeding rate low stock density monitor the stock and environment if we think about that we have to think about the sterilization of the fish tanks disinfection of the say uh, with the bleaching of the fish ponds and uh, water resources particularly water supply we have to see and we have to disinfect the hands feet boards etc we have to disinfect the this uh, farm visitors also um, and uh, we have to uh, see the exclusion of the wild fish exclusion of the birds and sterilization of the different equipments all these things should be taken into account for preventing the entry of these infectious agents in the farm premises then we will think about the fish health management if we should think about the chemotherapy vaccination farm management nutritional management and also recent methods like phage therapy bactericides and rni then with regard to probiotics and immunostimulants let me have a talk little regarding this same particularly soil probiotics we have three types of probiotics soil water and feed probiotics soil probiotics we can use 1.5 kg per acre and we can use also uh, this a uh, 10 kg per hectare maximum 100 kg per hectare in total culture period depending on the concentration of the beneficial bacteria and sludge conditions okay and it varies from company to company also this is about soil probiotics and with regard to water probiotics it is 0.5 dose is 0.5 to 1.0 kg per hectare per week if powder form if liquid form that is 0.5 to 2.5 kg and feed probiotics we should give 0.01 to 0.4 kg per uh, um, gram per kg feed with suitable binder you see but nevertheless we should mix all these say, water probiotics and feed probiotics together because the properties are different properties are different the water probiotics nature is different so feed probiotics nature is different all these probiotics and they are uh, uh, adding to the pond then with regard to immunostimulants we are you also we will use levamisole that is 5 to 10 mg per kg body weight and uh, also we can use this uh, uh, immunostimulants like lentinan polysaccharides oligosaccharides cesiophilan vitamin c vitamin e chitos, chitin and chitosan so uh, medicines are such things it is both uh, it is double edged sword uh, oh, oh, suppose it is less it will cause problem suppose it is more it is cause problem suppose i will tell you this uh, use of minerals in the stream use of minerals if we we'll use more amount of minerals then the streams will become hard it will not mold and it will cause several other types of problem if it will less then also the growth will not be there and it will cause several other problems also so both way and we, we should use adequate amount and optimum amount what is required and with regard to prevention so two dolls are there so we have to squeeze it squeeze means uh, suppose stressful situations proper stocking situations proper management ideal treatment and if we will think about the squeezing the dolls and if we will take this prevention then you will find a good doll that is a 
uh, that, that is already prevented with the disease, it's prevented from the disease. So what is prevention? The prevention is nothing but this to avoid the threat before it occurs. And uh, to get this preventive measures, we have to think about the water quality, genetics, immunization, feed quality, reduce the density, reduce the stress, dietary supplements, and early applications of the antimicrobials. So, so these things we have to consider to uh, as preventive measures. Then suppose preventive measures is failed, then we will go for protective measures. It is the next step and usually takes over this if the prevention fails. And what are the different components of these pr pr protective measures? That is transplant regulations, hygiene, vector and pest control, SPF seeds, and control of wild fish, quarantine, age, size, etc. These are all different components of protective measures. So both preventive and protective measures are uh, sufficient to handle the situations. Uh, and uh, I hope and uh, this uh, uh, treatment is not required if protective and preventive measures are adequately taken. And the treatment can be taken up uh, if it is warranted. If it is not possible to overcome the disease through protective and prevent through preventive and protective measures, then we can go for treatments. Otherwise, it is not. And uh, and a lot of things has to be considered for going before uh, going for the treatment. Then better management practices B, that is BMPs are set of management guidelines. It are these are not standards. We have to set the management guidelines how to proceed with the pond preparations, with the, with the treatment of the pieces and uh, with uh, stocking, with feeding, all these uh, with the use of manures, etc. These are the management guidelines we have to follow. Then we think about this good aquaculture practices. We have to think about the system, species, and recommended stocking season, then the region where the farming is done. This is with regard to good aquaculture practices. With regard to biosecurity, if you we'll think, then we have to consider the prevention, mitigations, and coping. Particularly, we have to identify the diseases of concern, then review your management practices, create the farm diagram, and identify the risk area, select the biosecurity and best practices, then implement your biosecurity. Many cases, I will tell you, this biosecurity is not stringent in our case. So we are failing, uh, and we are inviting several diseases. This is a biosecurity measures uh, taken for this uh, um, banami culture. They treated with the water with the calcium, this uh, hypochloride that is bleaching powder, then use of uh, the SPF seeds, then board and crop fencing. These are then disinfection of the cross nets, then rubber and switchboard, then the vehicle in uh, the vehicle before entering the farm, it is to be disinfected. So these are the from all the angles, starting from entry till to the harvest, every point we have to uh, no, be secure. Yes, there is not, there is uh, no possibility of uh, enter up, uh, ent uh, entrance of these uh, pathogens. Then uh, regarding the veterinary or medicinal products, okay, so there is huge number of medicinal products now floating in the market, okay, and the same medicinal products, veterinary products are being used in aquatic ecosystems. But uh, I can tell uh, this, uh, before using this uh, veterinary or medicinal products, we have to study its pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics, and we have to study the biology of the feces. So unless until studying all those things, we should not use these veterinary medicines. We have our aquaculture, or we should develop these aquaculture medicines as such for our species, our, uh, our, our own products should be developed, okay? And to develop these products, we have to study this biology. We have to study the pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics of the product. Then we have to suitably develop the, these things. Okay. I'll tell you one example. If we use tons and tons of this ivermectin and ectomectin, which cannot control this argulus. Because uh, this uh, ivermectin and ectomectin is uh, e being used to control the ticks in the cows. This cannot control the lice or louse in the fish. That is argulus. So this is one example I have given you. Several other examples are like that. So, but we have to develop our own products. And many companies, they are coming also. They are coming with these herbal products. They are coming with also indigenous products. And they are coming with the aqua products also. And it is also being used uh, in various ways. Some approved drugs and unapproved drugs. Oxytocin, uh, this uh, fluorophenical and uh, sulfamethoxine and uh, sulfamerazine. These are some of these approved drugs. Chloramphenical are not approved. And if you think about this USD approved fish drugs, that is the um, chorionic gonotropin, formalin, hydrogen peroxide, chloramine, oxytetracycline, tricane, chlorophenical, oxytetracycline, all these things. Then if you think about this uh, FDA low regulatory priority aquaculture drug, that is acetic acid, calcium chloride, 
and calcium hydroxide you see all these doses are there also carbon dioxide fuller salt garlic ice magnesium sulfate onion and papain they are also being used several other herbal extracts like sentinel acetaca are also being used tulsi and several other turmeric uh, tamarind several other things are being used also risk factors in aquaculture if you find if you want to have sustainable aquaculture development then you have to think about the food safety and human health risks you have to analyze the ecological risks you have to analyze the environmental risks social risks financial risks pathogen risks and genetic risks all these components are to be thought of seriously and uh, they studied this uh, seriously uh, then and there only we are able to get uh, the aquaculture development in a sustained way so you, we have to share the responsibility at, uh, uh, to protect the farm to protect the industry to protect the aquatic environment both small and commercial uh, scale and the cost of prevention is lower than the cost of managing the diseases also if you think about the best guidance that uh, we have to know the fish we have to know the pathogens four kids know the fish know the pathogens know the uh, system and uh, know the drugs so before implementing any treatment procedure or before adopting any treatment procedures we have to know all these four kids and then for sustainable aquaculture requires the environmental friendly treatment strategies for fish diseases we can use the prebiotics and we can use the probiotics to sustain these probiotic strains the prebiotics are used like glucans and uh, mannan oligosaccharides probiotic strains like lactobacillus bacillus and yeast and microalgae are being used and in between these two the symbiotics the this a uh, combination of both to, both are the symbiotics and this a uh, inactivation of these probiotic strains are these para pro, parabiotics and we can use these uh, plant secondary uh, this uh, secondary metabolites we can use the disinfectants like s2 we can use post uh, this uh, biotics like the byproducts of these probiotics like uh, vitamins peptides and thereby increasing the immunity uh, particularly the uh, this uh, mucus complementary systems lycosomes and phagocytosis so this is for sustainable aquaculture systems and the uh, tools and capacity and skills development especially for decision makers so we have to have operational manual field and laboratory and questionnaires recording systems data collection data analysis and the field logistic requirements and alternative to antibiotics should be there with the farmers to have sustainable aquaculture systems and important role of farmers actually the disease costs are too high for small scale uh, sector to survive okay so in that case we have to understand their needs and expectations getting them involved uh, and utilize their indigenous knowledge okay it is very important uh, they say to uh, this we have to <clears throat> develop the particularly you see and they say effective technology strategies which are accessible and affordable to the resource poor uh, systems another we are uh, this our research need should be uh, the need of the farmers okay the need of the farmers should not deviate from the research need or we should go for research of the farmers problem uh, farmers problem when the farmers problem is equivalent to the research problem then and there only the problems can be solved then now where the farmers can go for help the farmers the poor farmers they can go for help to the aqua one centers now nfdv last year last to last year only they have developed 100 different numbers of uh, these uh, hundreds of these aqua one centers in different parts of the country so their technicians are there they can help the farmers now field schools have been developed nasc uh, national center for sustainable aquaculture developed by empada different fisheries colleges are there icr institute are there state government laboratories are there blocks and offices district offices are there so there the farmers can approach for free consultancy for free discussion for free collaboration also then private clinics are there owned by the different fisheries professionals particularly unemployed youths and uh, many uh, they say qualified personnel also professionally qualified personnel they have opened up these private clinics also salem groups bearback biostat cp growwell masco they have their private clinics you have to deposit the money and get your this water analyzed get your feed analyzed get your uh, this specimen analyzed these uh, different uh, websites i have given they say www.ca.com empada.gov.in dasd.nic.in this is for reference uh, of the, the, our farmers or students they can go for the different para, uh, these uh, um, uh, uh, websites and they can get several informations from this with this i am closing my talk and uh, thanks to the organizers uh, and thanks uh, to the uh, these uh, participants uh, who are listening the talk and uh, mm, 
uh, if any doubts are there i may be uh, contacted through this number this is my whatsapp number also and uh, let me thanks once again and to all the organizers uh, who have passed, um, taken this much pain to arrange uh, such a beautiful uh, this uh, virtual seminar or virtual session uh, for the students and uh, for the uh, uh, other participants also thank you thank you once again thank you so much sir okay thank you sir thank you, thank any you, sir. questions sir we do not get any questions i think the information displayed and given by you is more than enough so sir uh, there are no questions it's very informative and i think the ppt explains everything in detail thank you sir okay okay thank you we have almost come to the end of today's sessions now i'd like to call upon professor moinuddin sheikh joint coordinator of bivok studies to propose the vote of thanks on the first day of the webinar am i audible yes sir so you are audible sir so you are audible you are visible you are audible thank you honorable convener pg study and research sub committee dr sajal bhattacharya our chief advisor and examination in charge pg and bivok studies dr chandramali sengupta respected speakers and all the participants on behalf of the organizing committee it's my privilege and honor <coughs> to put up thanks on this occasion first of all i would like to express my gratitude to our vice principal professor apurbo roy and barsar dr manos kobi for giving us an opportunity to organize this webinar by providing encouragement and support i am also very grateful to dr tathagato roy choudhury iqac coordinator for his constant inspiration i would like to thank our chief advisor and examination in charge dr chandramali singhupta for leading us in working towards the goal of conducting this webinar thank you ma'am a special thanks to dr bidhi samitra sen coordinator of bivok studies for providing immense support to make the webinar successful i also extend my heartfelt thanks to all the eminent speakers who blessed us with their presence and enlighten us with their commendable talk on the subject the enthusiasm and contribution of the faculty members of software development departments need special mention particularly professor shantanu modok and professor rishi bhattacharya without whom this webinar would not have been a success that it is i want to thank professor basuda basu professor vincent sobik gomes for their constant support i would like to thank professor beauty sarkar dr mukti chandra paul professor vidhan chandra jana for their back end support last but not least i want to congratulate all the valuable participants who blessed us with their presence and made this event a grand success we have just completed the day one of this two days two days long webinar i hope we all will meet tomorrow right at 11 am for another great experience thank you all till then have a great day ahead thank you so much thank you so much sir thank you we will meet you again all tomorrow the second day of the webinar at the same time till then goodbye and thank you